Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. They said we're gonna put a play together Though we don't know yet what it's about We'll let everybody be in it So that there's no one left to be in the crowd No, you think I'm wasting time here Not sculpting up an image to play This is my last letter Welcome, everybody, to the latest episode of Shumacast. I am Noel, joined, as always, by Angie. Hello, everyone. And we have a wonderful special guest with us today. Everyone, please welcome Lore. Hi. Hey, welcome. Thank you. I'm really excited. You are the wife, Kay, who previously appeared on our episode of The Wiz, and you are someone I've always wanted to actually sit down and chat about a movie with, so it's wonderful finally having you on. Oh, same to you. Ever since I found out that you were doing these podcasts, I've been really excited to try to get on one. (laughs) I will make note of that for future podcasts, too. This is your first podcast experience? Um, I think you did a made a fail, didn't you? I did one, yeah. Okay. I was really nervous, so hopefully it won't show as much this time. Oh, you're fine. But I love podcasts. It's pretty much all I listen to. And I know I've done many episodes of K where you have brief appearances in the background. <laughs> Unfortunately, I do have a hard time not responding to random comments that come out through the household, especially if I think they are wrong. It's okay. Often they still make it into the show. <laughs> oh, God. Well, you know, when I listen to podcasts, I've been known to sit there and comment, so I totally understand that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you just happen to be recorded. Sometimes I forget there's a recording. <laughs> but yeah, I was listening to The Wiz, and I realized that was the podcast where I hollered out that I'd never seen Wizard of Oz. <laughs> so I was, I was like, oh, no, I think I'm in this. Don't remember if that was in... It, it, did remember. that still make it in the final episode? I didn't make it in. Okay. Kevin having to explain that his wife has never seen it did make it in. <laughs> I have finally seen Wizard of Oz. Oh, good. Not the movie straight, but I saw it synced up to Dark Side of the Moon, and Ah. I figured that was just as good. Close enough. That's one way to see it, yeah. (laughs) So anyways, we're here to discuss the films of Joel Schumacher, of course. So what is your history with and feelings towards the films of Joel Schumacher? Well, okay. So Joel Schumacher, obviously, as I grew up in the 80s and 90s, huge name in filmmaking. But unfortunately, I mostly associated him with the Batman films that he made. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's common. Yeah. And I remember being kind of disappointed later as I got older and thought that the first two were just a lot better. Kind of thinking, well, you know, I wonder why he couldn't capture that. But the truth is, at the time that Batman Forever came out, I loved it. Me too. Mm. It was my favorite. So I can't knock it too much. I finally saw Flatliners Hmm. as an adult, and I was really impressed with it to the degree that I didn't want to see the new one because the first one to me was so special and so strange, and it scared me. I don't think I'd ever seen that side of his filmmaking. Well, that's going to be our next episode, by the way. Oh, really? (laughs) All right, because that's 1990, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. And we'll be covering the new one. Oh, okay. Yeah. So maybe it would be a good idea to compare them. But I have to be honest, that was his film that most impressed me. Hmm. And of course, then I found out later that he'd done St. Elmo's Fire and The Lost Boys, which is just an incredible movie. Hmm. But I didn't really know him as that filmmaker until later. Yeah, it is interesting how most of our generation has, I almost want to call it like a knee-jerk blind spot. Yeah. Anytime (laughs) his name is mentioned, (laughs) Batman just fills the memory. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And you have to actively look around it. (laughs) (laughs) We're discovering that's kind of a common thread in this show. Mm -hmm. Is Cousins a film either of you had ever seen before? No. I hadn't even heard of it. Mm. I didn't even know it existed, which is a shock because I'm actually a huge fan of Sean Young's work in the 80s. And if I had known she was in this, I would have seen it years ago. (laughs) Oh, if you had known her dancing was in this, you would have seen (laughs) it. Oh, my God. (laughs) We'll get there. (laughs) But yeah, I also had never seen it. It's one I knew vaguely existed, but I really had no association with it. And I know we had a bit of ambivalence getting to it in early episodes, but (laughs) it'll be interesting to finally discuss it. So production notes, I really don't have that many production notes on this one. Mm. Cousins, it's a Paramount production. It's a remake of a 1975 French film called Cousin Cousine, which was co-written and directed by Jean-Charles Tachella. And we'll be getting into that film later on in the episode, so I don't have much more to say about it right now. 
The 1989 remake was directed by Joel Schumacher and produced by William Aylin and George Goodman. The screenplay is by Stephen Metcalf, who is a playwright known for a handful of character dramas like Half a Lifetime, Jack Knife, The Roommates, and his directorial debut, Beautiful Joe. And I've never seen any of them, but I actually watched the trailers mm-hmm. to all of them prior to this. And it's like, yeah, they all look like they're exactly the same writer. A lot of people just sitting around talking about relationships. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> and he also wrote the pilot for the 1990 TV series adaptation of Turner and Hooch. <laughs> That was a TV show? There was a TV show based on the movie. It didn't last long. Oh, I can only imagine. And I did read the screenplay in prep for this. And while Mm -hmm. Metcalf is the only writer listed on the title page, up in the top corner, it said Schumacher Draft. So Hmm. I don't know if that means Joel did his own polish, if he did revisions, or if this was just a draft incorporating like notes and feedback from Joel. Okay. Mysteries of the 90s. Having gone through all these films that Joel has written himself and getting to this one, there's a lot of similarities Mm -hmm. in terms of the way scenes and dialogue play out. So I I wouldn't be surprised if he had some hand in it. Right. Otherwise, I've got nothing. <laughs> the only other really interesting fact to is that this was one of the first major Hollywood films that was shot in Vancouver, Canada. And this kind oh. of started the entire wave of, hey, let's move all the productions up there. <laughs> ah. So we have cousins to blame for that. Well, <laughs> as an X-Files fan, I thank you for that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> And anyone else have anything before I jump to the synopsis? Nope. I just want to say I'm glad this isn't an incestuous thing, which I kind of expected it to be by the title. I was a little worried myself. (laughs) I kept like, look what, oh, they're not really related. No, no. This is fine. It's two sides of, it's two different families, yeah. Right, but they put the focus on the cousins in the title to make you think that it's like, really, no, this has nothing to do with cousins other than that cousins by marriage. Anyway. Well, we still have yet to see what the French film is going to do with that. (laughs) True, true. Cousins is primarily set against the backdrops of various family get-togethers as Edie and Phil, both aged heads of their extended clans of kids, grandkids, and scowling aunts, get married, then unite again for Phil's death, then again as Edie tries again with Phil's cantankerous porn-loving brother Vince. Our focus is on two couples, one from each side of the family. Edie's daughter, Maria, a legal clerk, is struggling with a flashy husband, Tom, who's more interested in racking up sales at his car dealership and various not-so-secret indiscretions he keeps having on the side, as well as their daughter, Chloe, who's begun lashing out from lack of attention. On Phil's side, his nephew Larry seems like he's living a carefree life, leaping from job to job and cruising country roads on his motorcycle, and gets along well with his teenage son from his first marriage, but Larry's wife Tish seems disconnected and dissatisfied. At the first marriage, Tom and Tish end up having a fling. When Maria approaches Larry to discuss her suspicions about it, they end up connecting in ways they haven't been able to with their own spouses. They continue to meet and bond, initially flaunting it in front of Tom and Tish for a bit of revenge, but as the two get closer, they also have to confront what they would be leaving behind if they took the next step. After Phil's death, they finally take that step, running off to a lakeside cabin for a full day of lovemaking and takeout delivery. But when Maria has to lie to her daughter, she calls everything off. She tries to return to Tom and settle back into their life, but both wallow in their inability to connect. Tish also leaves Larry for a while, and they also settle into the routines of loneliness. At the marriage of Edie and Vince, things finally reach ahead when Larry crosses the room and asks Maria for a dance. Tom gives her an ultimatum, but Maria finally openly accepts Larry's affections, and they soar into a dance before the whole family, including the scowling aunt who reclaims her wedding gift and scours off. (laughs) As the film closes, we see the couple has sailed off on Tom's boat together with their kids, Chloe and Mitch, and have started a lakeside restaurant named Maria's. So Angie, do you recommend Cousins? No, I don't not recommend it either. (laughs) I know that's bad and all negative. It's just kind of there. I didn't love it. I didn't hate it. It has some good moments occasionally, but I felt like it was always just kind of lacking a little extra something to make me really endeared to these characters and care a little more about everything that they were doing. Laura, do you recommend it? I had similar feelings. I was also very lukewarm on the movie. However, as a time capsule of 1989 fashion, (laughs) I cannot say enough about this film. I felt personally attacked by Sean Young's wardrobe at every opportunity. (laughs) And I got to be honest with you, like also in a good way. It was almost like the filmmakers knew that this decade was about to end and just wanted to throw all they had at the screen. Otherwise, I found the love story to be, uh, uh, I wasn't a fan, but specifically Mm. for certain reasons. I guess, to be honest, I didn't feel it was genuine. Mm. Mm. I love the movie. 
I mean, I thought it was kind of a typical rom-com. You knew how it was going to end. Mm-hmm. It hit a lot of the beats, but I just loved the way it was made. I loved the intelligence and wit of the writing that it actually really dug into a lot of the meteor issues, a lot of the more problems of the relationship, as well as kind of the reasons behind the relationships. And I just love the world that it builds. I love I love the whole world of these tacky big family get-togethers that this film brings to life. I love the weddings. I love the funeral. I love the wedding theme park. Oh, oh okay. God. Well, now I did forget about that for a moment. <laughs> I felt like the first 20 minutes of this film was perfect in terms of just like telling a story. Hmm. The opening, the family's coming late to the wedding, the whole wedding scene. I mean, the big Italian family wedding. Everything about it was so warm and so real and so genuine. But the wedding chapel also, as like a product of that decade experience, I thought that was real. That was great. The wedding stuff I loved. <laughs> oh, yeah. I like the characters. I like the cast. I like the music. It's a film I want to go through and I just want to pull a bunch of stills because I think it's a beautifully shot movie. Mm. I really liked it. My only real complaint is I think it's a bit long and I think Ted Danson was in a bit of the wrong role, but I still think he gave a good performance. Oh, yeah. I had the same thought. I could not mm-hmm. buy Ted Danson in that role. No. I think everyone right. else was so well cast. I mean, he's doing a great job. God bless him. Oh, yeah. But <laughs> I don't think he was right for that role. No. You know, it was weird because in the beginning, when they first started falling in love, I was like, man, maybe there's just no chemistry between these two. I don't know. And I think eventually they did kind of work into it. But yeah, it's like for a guy whose big thing not too long before this was the whole Sam and Diane drama Mm -hmm. on Cheers, you would think he would make a good love interest, but he's... I don't know. There's just something missing from him that he just doesn't quite work as the lead of this. What was funny was when I was reading the script, I didn't look at any like cast list or anything. I thought he was Tom. (laughs) I would have bought that. I would have bought that. Mm -hmm. You know, Larry is a t-shirt and jeans, cool guy, rides around on his motorcycle, kind of freewheeling, Mm -hmm. you know, lives life by the seat of his pants type of thing. I was getting like a Channing Tatum type of dude, you know, Mm. not a guy who wears the suits and ties that (laughs) Ted Danson wears in this movie. (laughs) Right. It felt like the character on the page was clashing with the visuals of Ted Danson. And I think he still gave a good performance. I still think it's a good character, but I still think probably someone else could have been better in that role. Yeah. I mean, honestly, what was funny, because William Peterson is playing the flustered husband who's not doing a very good job, he usually plays the slick, cool, brooding characters because he did all those 80s thrillers, Manhunter, all that stuff. Like, I could almost see the two of them just swapping. Yeah, I had the same thought. In fact, I recognized him from Manhunter, and I thought, you know, I bet this movie would be a lot more interesting if they just swapped the two main male leads. Hmm. I'm wondering if they were trying to intentionally go more against type. Possibly. But I think the problem, again, is that Ted Danson still still feels like he's playing his typical type of role in a role that doesn't fit that type. Right. Yeah. Whereas William Peterson actually does a good job playing a different type of character. Ted Danson is he's so Ted Danson. <laughs> <laughs> and don't get me wrong. I love Ted Danson. Again, I still think there's some really, really great acting he does in this movie. But it's just he didn't quite fall in with that character. No. He definitely doesn't strike me as a dance instructor. <laughs> <laughs> Though that was a really fun dance instructing scene mm-hmm. with just him and all the seniors. I like that too. I felt like the chemistry between mm-hmm. Ted Danson and Isabella Rossellini just wasn't there for me. Mm. Yeah. And I thought she was so good as that role. She was selling it and she just looked every bit the part of that role. And I felt like if she hadn't been as good, it might not have been as obvious. <laughs> See, and I did actually get a lot of chemistry from them. I kind of liked all those little playful moments between them. I mean, one of my favorite shots in the movie is just after they've had their fling in the cabin where it's just him on the bed looking out the door and there she is sitting on the porch mm-hmm. and just those looks that they had. I just thought that, that was, was lovely. Yeah. I just thought there was a lot of great tenderness to him. But I think also part of it is it's Ted Danson doing a lot of his usual Ted Danson stuff, doing a lot of his little yeah. kind of improv bits. Once it got to the point where he tells her, I'm thinking about kissing you. And I guess because of their closeness or, you know, maybe it was helping bring them into the roles as well. I started feeling it more. But all of the stuff leading up to that of them going through that little marketplace and the dance. I'm just kind of like, these guys are just going through the motions here. And it was only when they started to really get close that I really started to feel it and go, okay, yeah, these are two people that really love each other Mm -hmm. and are stuck in a bad situation. Yeah. And again, a large part of that, I think, also helps just the way the film is shot and the music and all that Mm -hmm. stuff. They do a really good job of getting those emotional beats. Yeah. But one of the other issues that I kind of have with Larry 
is I don't quite understand his motives behind the affair. Because I understand why Tish is dissatisfied with their relationship, but I don't understand what it is that's keeping him from trying to connect more with Tish, from addressing the issues. Because most of what I'm getting is he doesn't want to be pinned down and she wants to settle. Mm -hmm. You know, with her whole, why can't we get a car? Why can't we get a normal apartment? And he just kind of wants to live life his own way. When I watched it the second time, I noticed there was a scene when they come back from the wedding after he realizes that something has happened with her and Tom, and she's casually telling him about this job opportunity that mm -hmm. his uncle offered him. And that, to me, was when I noticed he starts to check out because she's doing the same thing that his ex-wife did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think that was actually meant to be more of a point. I had the same initial question, which was, he seems like a good guy. What is it that makes him want to pursue this? Besides the fact that Isabella Rossellini is beautiful and right. you know, perfect in every way. And I think he's genuinely connecting with a person, but still, yeah. why is he willing to leave his current relationship behind? I think it's the combination of her infidelity plus her subtly pressuring him to be the person that he's not and that yeah. being yeah. the tipping point for him. I'd actually go even further back and say, why did these two even end up together in the first place? place right <laughs> you know maybe because she's obviously much younger than him so he was like trying to be a free spirit so maybe he was attracted to this young beautiful woman and that's all we need to know I'm guessing it was a rebound from his first relationship that ended yeah. up going on longer than either of them really expected it to right right so I'm not really questioning the fact that oh, they're yeah. falling apart because I'm kind of like why are you even together <laughs> yeah Move it over to her is they never vilify Tish. Right. No. That was awesome. You know, she has a lot of genuinely good complicated stuff that she's going through too. Mm -hmm. She was never out to hurt Maria. She was mm -hmm. so dissatisfied with her own thing that she reached out for this one opportunity. And I think, you know, again, you, you have scenes where she feels guilt. She feels anger. She feels all these other things. But she's also like, but I still had genuine reasons why I did that that aren't being addressed. And I still need to go where I need to go. Mm -hmm. Also, I think the treatment of her at the end of the film where she is shown to accept what's happened and wants him mm -hmm. to move on genuinely was very surprising for me in a good way mm -hmm. i was so expecting them to kind of throw her under the bus as a real villain and when they didn't do that it just made me so happy because it's such a great role for a woman to have as someone who does commit an act of infidelity and then does kind of get what's coming to them but at no point are you really against her as a villain mm -hmm. i like how her and larry are at peace they kind of let each other go there at the end in a really respectful way maybe it just ties to how you're so used to seeing these things go, but I'm like, man, she is really forgiving. I certainly couldn't just let it go like that the way she does. I mean, I know obviously she did commit the wrong first, but the fact that Larry stayed with her when he was clearly falling in love with someone else, like there's a good reason right. to be pissed about that. Well, and that's why I like there's that scene where she has the emotional breakdown in the restaurant mm -hmm. and that Maria actually confronts her and says, we aren't having an affair. We just wanted you to think we were to get revenge. Mm -hmm. It's a nice, honest confrontation between those two. That was good. I like that it didn't devolve into a fight like it right. does with them men, I felt that that was kind of a more honest treatment of the way that women relate to one another. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why I think Tish was more able to just leave. Yeah. Just pack up her thing saying, I see where this is going. Even if it doesn't work out between you two, it's not working out between us anymore. And so she just leaves. And mm -hmm. I don't think she holds any ill grudge, but it's like she's just at a point where she's ready to move on. Mm -hmm. And I like that. And Sean Young was also just a really great actress. <laughs> oh, she was amazing. <laughs> I mean, she's Sean Young. <laughs> it's not that she necessarily plays the same exact character in every single movie year, but she's got such a unique energy to her. Yeah. She's never boring. No. That's for sure. You could never call Sean Young boring. No. <laughs> I don't think she made a lot of great choices later in her career, but her 80s films, I'm so on board with everything she does. To me, she is the quintessential 80s woman. Mm. She is always mm. playing this woman who you feel that she is strong and she is driven and she is always witty. And even when she's in distress, she's got it together. And I feel like that character was her all over. The dancing was, what was that? <laughs> that was, I actually went back and made a couple of gifs of that scene because I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Oh, did you see the ones that I made too? Oh, I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> oh, yeah. I captioned all of mine, 1989 wedding final boss. <laughs> I have to say, you know, again, discussions come up about Joel Schumacher. Is he a good director? Is he not? The with or without you sequence at that wedding <laughs> is a work of cinematic art. I got to agree. It is hilarious. It is magnificent. I mean, just the fact that it's a family gathering to dance on the floor at a wedding and they are doing the worst dancing. They have the <laughs> worst cover band. It is the tackiest decor. 
it is still warm and energetic and everyone's having a fun time. It's still telling this story and it's awful and amazing at the same time. And I think it is brilliant. It is brilliant. That cover offended me. It really it was did. bad. Well, but again, as that cover kicks in, as the bride and groom start doing the sway. <sighs> and who does that for their wedding song? Oh my God. Oh, no. It was such a bad choice. <laughs> It was. But I even love the groom just standing there, you know, his feet locked, just kind of rocking from side to side. And, and then, yeah, Sean Young bringing up the guy to dance. And she goes right up in front of the table, pauses for a second, and then just starts doing the weirdest arm <laughs> dance. It is hilarious in the truths that it captures. Yes. <laughs> Moments like that is like, I'm on Joel Schumacher's side. He knows how to capture things. Mm. <laughs> I gotta say, I feel like I'm liking this movie more as I'm talking about it. Because I'm thinking, oh yeah, and then that happened and that was <laughs> wild. And I do want to recommend people see that just for that scene. Yeah, you gotta at least look up that scene, that's for sure. <laughs> Sadly, it's not on YouTube. I'm guessing it's with or without you taking it down over copyright reasons. But Laura, let me just highly recommend. I think you would actually probably enjoy digging through some more of Joel's 80s work and even some of his 70s work. I think it's got a vibe that I think would really click with you. I would take that recommendation if it's anything like this because his eye for direction on that whole piece was just I mean do you think that he had any influence over that wardrobe again because that was spectacular he is a former fashion designer you mentioned that and as soon as you said that I thought yeah. oh my god it all makes so much sense all of Joel's <laughs> films have very striking design I should go ahead and mention and we got a showing young connection here the costume designer of this movie Michael Kaplan his very first movie in 1982 was Blade Runner <gasps> Oh, wow. Oh, okay. that's fantastic. The tacky wedding decor is the same designer <laughs> who did Blade Runner. I believe it. I believe it. And who is currently doing all of the Disney Star Wars movies. Oh, I didn't know that. And the recent wave of Star Trek movies. So, I mean, oh this God. is someone who is still one of the major costume designers in Hollywood. Give this guy an Oscar. Yeah. <laughs> And then kind of shifting over to the other main family. So Angie, what do you think of Isabella Rossellini as Maria? She's lovely. She's wonderful. I mean, I love Isabella in like everything I've ever seen her in. So that helps. You really feel for her in that she got into this marriage when she was so young and now she's got her daughter who she truly cares about and she doesn't know what to do about the fact that her husband's a jerk. She's just so sweet and I want to hold her and tell her everything's going to be okay. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like she kind of exemplifies that typical, the woman who deserves so much better, but she's trying to make the best out of what she has. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But her sadness in this film, I love the way she portrays her character with this deep melancholy, even when she's at these happy events. You know, you really mm -hmm. feel for her. You really feel like, oh man, her husband's a jerk. Why does he do this to her? You know, and why does she stay? But you kind of understand that it's in her character not to change things mm -hmm. and probably the way she was raised. And I didn't actually realize, having seen this film twice, I didn't catch that Edie was her mother. I thought it was her yes. aunt the entire mm -hmm. time. I thought that was an aunt of hers. No, because they had that brief moment of her three lovely daughters and it's yeah. the table with Isabella Rosalina and the other two women. I completely missed that. And to me, that changes a lot of the dynamic because I thought this was like a close aunt kind of giving her advice. I didn't realize that this was her own mother. And that makes it a little bit more sad because it's like, I wish she could have confided in her more from the beginning. Mm -hmm. What's fascinating about Maria is, yeah, she just wants to make things work. I love that scene where she even tells her husband that she knows about all the affairs, but if you tell me about them, then I'll have to leave you. Yes. Mm -hmm. As long as he hasn't confessed to anything, she can just kind of deny it and move on. Yeah. But even then, it's still eating at her. Mm -hmm. I thought that was a really powerful moment for the character because I feel like her husband, when he was taking advantage of her, I feel like he really didn't understand that she was so much smarter, but that she was kind of settling for him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She wasn't happy to be a little long on this as long as he was keeping up the front. That revelation that she knows, that was amazing to me because to me that felt like so much more of a catching out than, you know, seeing them together. And then what was interesting was what ultimately made her reject Larry and go back to Tom wasn't conflicting feelings over Tom. It was conflict over her daughter and how mm -hmm. her daughter has been lashing out, you know, abusing this boy at school, spilling, making messes, breaking things. Because she sees this conflict, she doesn't know how to express it, she doesn't know how to sort it out, and no one's giving her any attention because they're all caught up in their conflicts and their affairs, and mm -hmm. the daughter's just not getting enough love. And there's just that one moment where, you know, it's this whole romantic sequence in the cabin, and then Maria hanging up the phone and saying, I just lied to my daughter. 
That was heartbreaking. Yeah. Yeah. What I like about this film is it doesn't shy away from those complexities. It has all of its sweetness and its romance and its adventure, but it's also really hard to watch at times because it's really honest about a lot of the emotional struggles that everyone's going through. I actually have a lot to say about the affair itself and the way it's portrayed, but I don't know if now is the best time to get into it or if we're going to talk about more of the characters. Well, let's go ahead and talk about Tom first, and then we can go ahead and lead into that. Okay. So, Laura, what did you think about William Peterson as Tom? I liked the actor a lot. Of course, the character was perfectly detestable, and yeah. I, I liked that. He was so good in the role. It just felt like when he finally did start to realize what mattered, it was so too little too late that I couldn't even feel bad for him. I love his interactions with Sean Young. I love that he seems to know how superficial he is, but at the same time, he can't stop himself. I didn't like his treatment of Sean Young, I should say. Right. But I liked how she kept one-upping him in the interactions and how she really was better than him, and she knew it. But she was kind of slumming with him, and she kind of knew what it was all about, but he kept trying to chase some ideal... And the scene where he goes and tells all his girlfriends he's not going to see them anymore. Right. That <laughs> There's that whole montage of just revealing yeah. who this guy is. The way he played that, I'm thinking like, this has got to be based on somebody that somebody knows because it was so <laughs> awful. We can't see each other anymore. Are you wearing yeah. the black panties? <laughs> Yeah, it was yeah. so awful, Ugh. but it didn't feel like a caricature. It felt like maybe someone knows too many of these guys out there and wrote that from real life. And you know, it's not the first time or the last time that he'll go around and make those rounds and say it's over. Oh, yeah. He's just oh, yeah. so awful. Like he does way too good a job. I hated him. I wanted to punch him in the face. Every time he got into a fight, I'm like, please let him get beat up. Yeah. <laughs> He keeps trying to just assert control Ugh. in ways mm -hmm. where it's like, just, dude, shut up. Right, right. He reminds me of the character in The Wedding Singer that Drew Barrymore's marrying. Yes! Just the oh same kind of awful, awful jerk. Ugh. And you know he watches Miami Vice. I mean, that's yes, just a yes. given. Well, right. What's funny is, as of this recording, I'm editing the St. Elmo's Fire episode where we bring up The Wedding Singer. Because <laughs> what also this character reminds me a lot of is the Judd Nelson character from St. Elmo's Fire. Mm. Yeah. The guy who's just constantly cheating on his girlfriend because she keeps delaying their marriage and he's like but we need to get married because then i'll stop cheating on you right <laughs> and it's like this is literally who that character would grow up to be yeah because like he even like says you know sometimes a man's gotta prove himself or something yeah. like i'm glad she just shuts that down because yes. it's like oh shut yeah. up dude just shut up yeah and i'm glad that they played it on just the note they did they didn't make him like too over the top or too anything but they're mm -hmm. still hitting all the right toxic masculinity notes yeah and even his whole i gotta outperform everyone at work oh yeah though i do love the guy uh getting into the accident right <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there was a cutscene from the script where they reveal these guys are just doing mountains of coke in the dealership. That's really? Oh, I'd buy that. Because <laughs> it wasn't 80s enough. Yeah, especially the other guy. <laughs> I actually like how he did seem to be fine as a father, too. I mean, the scene yeah. in the beginning where he runs across traffic to get the little girl's blanket so she won't have a meltdown. I mean, I thought that's, you know, hey, he's doing it. He's a terrible husband, but I like that they didn't <laughs> yeah. double down on that. One of the interesting things... The main difference between the script and this film is there was more of Tom and Tish in the last half hour mm -hmm. where the two of them actually do reconnect. The whole scene where she realizes that he can't perform if he's not married anymore or stuff like that, mm. that was added. Instead, you actually had scenes where the two of them actually start to discuss their business philosophies and actually kind of start relating to each other in terms of oh, wow. how they approach, mm. you know, the business world and all that stuff. He gives her advice that is what leads her to get the new job. And she gives him advice that leads him to top out on the car sales thing. There is still a sense in the end that they're coming together, even though the whole third act in this film is different than in the screenplay where, you know, in this one, it's the whole Larry coming up and asking for a dance. Mm -hmm. In the actual script, it was Vince is giving his big family speech. The two couples are still eyeing each other from opposite sides of the room. And Tom finally gets up, you know, confronts Larry. And then Vince up on the stage gives this whole big speech about how, you know, maybe you guys wouldn't be so miserable if you had just changed places. And then you sort of see the couples just swap. Oh, wow. I don't know hmm. what that would have looked like. Yeah. Yeah, I think it was entertaining, but it was still a bit stagey. I think it's more authentic the way that it actually played out. I agree. I like that Tish breaks off and kind of goes her own way. Mm -hmm. I like that Tom is recognized for how toxic he is and is just kind of left behind. Yeah. I much prefer that. Mm-hmm. 
I definitely think there are seeds of things being set up in the first couple of acts that would make you think that that's where it's going, but mm-hmm. I'm glad they didn't go that way. Yeah, I really like the scene where he just comes up and asks her to dance, mm-hmm. and Tom gives her the ultimatum, and she accepts the dance. Yeah, I did like yeah. the simplicity of that. It felt much more real and much less staged. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Some of the other stuff that was cut out is there is more with the mother discussing what's happening. Vince had more time with Larry where he was discussing what was happening. It's basically the entire family knows what's going on. And it's basically just took Vince to say, can y'all just shut up and do what you need to do? Mm. It was interesting, but I still like how they ultimately redid it. Yeah. Can we talk about Mitch real quick? Yes, let's go ahead and talk about Mitch. (laughs) Because I had a lot of feelings about this character. When the character was first introduced, I didn't understand the family relationship between Mitch and Ted Danson's character. I didn't realize it was supposed to be father and son. Right. It's from his first marriage. Right. And I got that later, but I couldn't tell how old he was supposed to be. It was kind of like a Denny from the room situation where I almost thought like it was an older actor playing a much younger child. And then by the time I figured out he was in college, it was just so strange. I felt like that kid was milking it to be the energy of the film and the sense of humor. And I just did not like that character at all. (laughs) Was he in college? Because I thought he was still in high school. I think he's about to start college. Oh, is he? Because I'm looking, the actor would have been 18 at the time. He looks 25. Like, I could not figure this out. Because <laughs> I know he was he still played soccer in school and, you know, had the crush with right. the girl with the bicycle. Oh, that's right. The bi- right. Oh. I think he wanted to get into a college with a film program. Larry says next term he's going to be with his mom and then he's going off to college. Mm. So he's okay. probably in like his senior year. I understood that to mean next term as in like his next term of college. Right. So he was supposed to be in high school. I think yeah. so. So that's why he's still. Okay has to live with parents and then he can go off i could not figure that out at all and the video he made for the family (laughs) yeah he's a weird kid it was so awful it wasn't even funny and since this must have played so much better a few decades ago this must have been really funny and i'm watching this now and i'm like this kid's kind of an asshole I don't think it was supposed to be, I mean, funny, it may be in an absurd way. Like, I think he's definitely supposed to be one of those people who thinks that shocking people is art. Yeah. Yeah. But I think we're supposed to laugh at the idea that he thinks this in the film. And instead, I just felt like he was really bad at understanding the boundaries of family relationships. (laughs) It just felt to me like the whole shock value thing was really inappropriate. And I didn't like it. And I think part of it is, it's like Chloe, he's acting out for attention. Mm -hmm. Right. Because he has problems too with connecting to his parents. He's not getting enough attention, being the child of two homes. That's not always a bad thing, but that's not always a good thing. And you know, I think a large part of this, it's a mess. This is how he's projecting his feelings. Mm -hmm. Well, it's funny because the script played him as more like a dark and brooding Tim Burton-y type kid. Oh, God. Okay, Uh, now now I understand where that came from because it seems so at odds with his personality. But I kind of like how Keith Coogan they played a little more laid back and and winking. Mm -hmm. It's awful the things that he does, but I think they're funny because he's just doing it to get, like, telling the kids the gory horror story. That was funny. That Mm -hmm. I thought was genuine, very funny. That got a big laugh out of me. Or telling Aunt Sophia his assassination plot. (laughs) I am just watching this like, who talks to their granny like this? Like, this is crazy. (laughs) To be fair, it's Aunt Sophia. Everyone has fun at her expense. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't think he's actually related to her either. No. Because she's from the Maria side of the family. So he probably just feels like, you know what? I'm just going to mess with this little lady. I don't care. Oh, my God. It made me so uncomfortable. (laughs) See, but again, it's like, I think he still has problems with the current situation. There's even the scenes where, like, Tish is trying to bond with him and is trying to help him out with his relationship stuff, and he's just shutting her out. Mm -hmm. Well, I wanted to tell her in that scene, just shut up. It's not your kid. Let him figure it Mm -hmm. out. You're coming across too strong. Right. I don't know. I just, the whole character gave me the willies. He looked like he was in his 20s. I couldn't figure out how old he was. I couldn't figure out what his (laughs) deal was. It was weird. I guess he kind of reminds me, not exactly, but of people I kind of knew around that age who were like... Same, same. Trying so hard to like, I'm mature. And it's like, okay, kid, you'll figure it out eventually. And I think you kind of do see him, you know, once he gets the girlfriend and he's kind of happier at the end of the film, you kind of get the feeling, all right, this kid's starting to settle down and be a real adult now, maybe, you know. <laughs> See, but that's why I actually like the wedding video scene because, again, it's like the first part of it is like, oh, yeah, here's all the funny shenanigans at the wedding and then it starts to get a little darker. It's just puking and pissing and Ugh. he starts doing his whole thematic contrast of the consumption and consumerism of the wedding versus people in Africa who are starving, you know? Mm-hmm. It's like you know, everyone in the room just shuts down. 
which was, again, very real. You know what? Maybe I relate too much to this character because I was one of those kids in high school that tried too hard to be edgy, although I never did anything like that. I probably would have thought this kid was really cool when I was 15 or 16, and maybe that's why I'm cringing so hard at it now. What made me gravitate towards him is I never really took any of that seriously because mm-hmm. God Lord knows even I had my shock jock phases. Right. But what I love is that you do genuinely see the love oh, yeah. between him and his dad, yeah. him and his grandpa. They had a good relationship. He's not mm-hmm. a bad kid, but he's definitely flashing out for attention. Mm-hmm. And he's not doing it in a violent way. He's just doing it in a, I'm just trying to push everyone's buttons type of way. That's why it didn't really affect me because it's like, I get where he's coming from and it's, I don't take it any of it seriously. Mm-hmm. And you can kind of see him gradually growing out of it as the film goes along too. Yeah. He did get better as it went on. But by that time mm-hmm. I was like, oh, so is he in high school? Is he going to college? You know? I guess that whole thing just threw me. (laughs) Here's the other thing, though, is if he was only there with his dad for one term, like nine to ten months pass over the course of this movie. Mm -hmm. So would that be for a full school year as a term or just a semester or? You'd have to ask the guy who wrote the script, I guess. (laughs) Yeah, I couldn't figure out the time frame on this. I don't know what they mean. It's just the way he said it. Because again, it should be pointed out, there's that whole background story of at the first wedding, there's this young couple that first meet, Mm -hmm. and then we have their wedding several months later where she's already pregnant. Right. Right, That was wild. And then in the final wedding, she's already given birth. Mm -hmm. So it must have been over a year has passed in terms from the very beginning of the film. I don't even think over a year. I think more just like 10, 11 months. Oh, yeah. Well, I guess, Mm -hmm. yeah. I think what we're meant to assume is that when they first met at the wedding is when that baby was conceived. Oh, Probably so, okay. Yeah. That's why she was also then pregnant at the second wedding. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then by the time you get to the final wedding, here's the newborn baby. Yeah. Well, I did like that little mini story arc with them in the film. I thought that was yeah. really cute and funny. Mm-hmm. It was funny. And again, I love how it's like the family knows, the family sees, the family has a laugh at it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right. I like how chill a lot of family was a lot of these things. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, Grandpa's up there bearing his ass to the world. That was great. (laughs) I love that. I thought to myself, who are these people? So different than the stuffy family upbringings that I was used to. But yeah, they really seem like a loving, close-knit family. Yeah. And again, that it's like they have these big get-togethers so frequently that we have a story set against the backdrop of all these big Mm get-togethers. So, Laura, did you have anything else you want to add about the broader relationship? Yes, actually. So I think this is definitely a case of attitudes changing over the decades and this film being a product of its time. I was actually very disappointed at the way that they portrayed the conceit of the film being that these characters are pretending to have an affair while their respective partners are actually having an affair. But I would argue that both parties are having an affair and that there's no Mm -hmm. pretense going on beyond the point where they first start to talk about each other in a way that is definitely not friendly. I think that the idea the movie has that an affair is sex is very old-fashioned. I think that it's kind of doing a disservice to the idea that these characters of Maria and Larry are not the innocent party, which is not to say that I look down on the actions in the film. I thought they were very realistic, but I believe that they are engaging in an extramarital affair much earlier than the film wants us to believe. And I found that to be very disingenuous. I also felt that it was something that I didn't realize this was a remake of a French film. It's very French. Mm. <laughs> that was the other thought I had. But this would play so much better as a European film because it just doesn't feel to me like the yeah. attitudes in it about sex and love and marriage were so different. And I found that that really detracted from it for me. I think you can probably argue whether the film wants us to believe it's an affair or not. But I think it's pretty clear that Larry and Maria are lying to themselves. Oh, yeah. That oh, well, as long as we're not kissing, we're not cheating. It's like, yeah, but the way that you're talking to each other, all the time you're spending together, like, yeah, you're totally, you're in it, pals. You're falling in love. That's enough. And I think that is at least part of the point that, yeah, we can see from the outside that they are breaking the rules, but in their minds, they're going, well, as long as I don't push it to that point, I'm okay. I guess, you know, now that you say that, I think you are right. I may have been reading it too literally. I'd take a few times to watch a film to get a deeper level. So you may be right about that, that the film did want us to understand that. I just felt kind of played by it. Like, does the film really expect me to believe that these two people, what they're doing is Mm -hmm. more morally scrupulous than what the respective partners are doing? Because to be honest, it was far more intimate. Right. And that's where I definitely think part of the point of the film is that's their denial. Mm -hmm. Well, we're not crossing the line, but they're lying to themselves by saying that while Tish and Tom have had a physical affair, Maria and Larry are definitely having an emotional affair. Mm -hmm. And I think it's less 
about saying which is moral or immoral because even the physical affair doesn't break up the family. Right. Right. It's not like held down as like absolute, you have crossed this line, we can never recover from it. It's more about disconnect and finding someone to connect with. Spouses who no longer connect with each other mm -hmm. and are trying to find some way to connect with each other and are failing, and they just kind of stumble into the situation where these two respective spouses are now connecting. And that's why I think there's a lot of avoiding getting to the point where they take that extra step. That's why they keep putting off sleeping together and they keep talking. They even like talk about, so what would happen if we slept together? What would happen if we mm -hmm. become a couple? And they're obviously thinking about it, but they're still holding it off. And I don't think it's yeah. until the funeral when Phil dies that it impels them to finally take that step and see where this is actually going. And even then when they do, they pull back. Mm -hmm. And that's what I didn't understand. Okay. It seemed to me like, and again, I don't want to cast my own moral judgments on the character because I think they were all well realized and all of them had very good motivations for what they did. But I didn't like the way that they had her shy away from it after the sex because to me, that was almost the least intimate thing that they did together. Mm. It didn't make sense to me. It would have made more sense if there was some kind of a big confession of love or if there was something more heartfelt. But the fact that it was just sex that gave her second thoughts seemed like the movie was pushing the idea that sex is the thing. It's the big boundary. It's what real love is. And I just didn't react to that well. I think a large part of that is that's the line that you can no longer be open about. And it's like, that's when she has to start lying. Because it's like, mm -hmm. she's open about the fact that her and Larry are hanging out and talking and doing all this stuff. And that's making Tom pissed. But it's like, he can't say they're doing anything wrong. And it's like, again, they're having this air of denial about it. Mm -hmm. But then once she does that, she has to lie to her daughter. Again, it's not that she cheated on Tom. That's the issue. Right. It's that she had to lie to her daughter. Well, that's true. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Again, I think that's why the big moment at the end is not so much that they can be together, but that they can be open about how they feel when they're together. They can finally do this in front of the entire family. And the entire family's been waiting for them to do this because they've been seeing the feelings that they've had for each other. <laughs> what I like about this film, and this kind of gets into a lot of the great ways that Joel has explored themes in the past. It's not so much that it's a story about good or bad or right mm -hmm. or wrong. There's no real hero or villain. It's more just these are situations that happen. These are the ways that people are hurt by it. This is the way that people come together through it. It's finding the good in the situation while still having to deal with the bad in the situation. Mm -hmm. And I really, really like that approach because it felt more honest. It's like, again, affairs that people have, you can get into, is that just a blanket good or bad thing? But it's, I think, again, very much expressing something underlying that's going on in the relationship. You're either re rejecting a partner, you're disconnected. You can't find something. You're looking for something else to connect with. And I kind of like how this film explores that. But I have to ask, do you think that an audience watching this in 1989 would also feel that they had crossed a line when they went from being just acquaintances talking about their respective partners and fidelities to spending that intimate time together, opening up about their thoughts and feelings and discussing sex and physical intimacy without engaging? Do you think that this would have been received the same way as it would be today? I don't know. Again, we've had stories about affairs in Hollywood all the time, but I mm. don't think any had really expressed it in this way before. And again, it does feel very French because, you know, it does. Yeah. Over in Europe, they've been doing stories like this. You know, mm -hmm. that's not a new thing. But again, it is OK. I, I'm not going to get into the box office release just yet, but let me just say it did not do well. Mm -hmm. ah. So, no, it was not received. Did did pretty well critically, but it did not do well commercially. Mm. And it's hard to say whether or not if this had like maybe come out like another 10 years later or more recently, would it have done better? Because movies like this wouldn't really get that much of a theatrical release these days anyways. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's sadly true. Yeah, This would be a TV movie or a direct video I guess, again, I have my own biases and hang-ups as a person who is in a relationship oh, yeah. to an asexual person. I guess when I watched the film, I thought, this is such an outdated idea that sex could be a tipping point for a relationship. But, you know, now that you mentioned that they might have been trying to show the way that they deny it to themselves, I can definitely see that point of view. I think one thing that can be done is you could take Larry and Maria actually having sex out of this and it would still hit the same point where going to the cabin is still them running off to be together. Yeah, that's interesting. I didn't think of that. And you could even not have them have sex and still have her lie to her daughter and have the relationship then go beyond where it does. And this story would still work. So that's why I don't think the sex is really that huge of a definition as so much it is just representation of them being together. I think you're correct. 
But it does make me think, and us talking about this, that because this is for an American audience, would the studios or the average viewer react in the same way if they didn't have sex? It's got to be steamy. They got to have sex. We got to right. market the sex. So I think there is a fair criticism in what you're saying. Oh, yeah. That it's definitely a lot more nuanced than a lot of other romantic comedies at the time would have been, but it is still there. And again, I like that there's not much exploration of the actual act of sex. It's usually what's mm -hmm. happening leading up to it, what's happening after it. Yeah. Grad, you know, Joel, I don't think was that interested in watching straight people have sex anyways. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Unless he does it like St. Elmo's Fire, where it's just a really funny montage involving a giant necklace, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know what? I think you're right. If they had taken the sex out, it would have been just as impactful. And I wish they had. I honestly wish they had, because I think that would have spoken more to the idea that these two people are more physically intimate with each other than they are with their spouses much earlier in the film than mm -hmm. they want to believe. Mm -hmm. And I guess I would have appreciated that a lot more because I like that they get together at the end and they kind of sail away together and they're a family. I mean, it, yeah, it was a little over the top and sappy, but, you know, I appreciated it. They didn't have to have like a big makeout scene at the end or something. Hey, if you want even more sappy, the actual script ended with a 50 year montage. Oh, my God. Ugh. Following them up until they're elderly. Oh, no, <laughs> no, no thank I, you. Nobody wants to see that. that. That's too much. And then it ended with the title card directed by Mitch. You know? <laughs> You know what? If they had done it, though, like Zardoz style, like until they had some skeletons, I would have been all for it. I'd have yeah. been all for it. But I did like the ending. I just felt a little bit cheated by the idea that what I got from the film, which was that these two are so in denial. But I guess I felt the film wanted the audience to be in denial about it as well. So right. if that's the point, then I well done film. <laughs> yeah, it's the thing where I don't think the sex hurts the film. But again, the fact that it's not necessary again, you know, sex is just talking about how people connect anyways. And again, the film is all about how they connect. Right. It's a very basic visual metaphor of, well, when we see a couple connecting, we got to have the love scene. It's definitely a very typical Hollywood thing. I think we're just so used to it. Yeah, that's true. And I'm trying to think of other things to bring up. So we got Edie and Phil initially. Laura, what did you think about Edie? I really liked her. I thought that she just seemed like a woman who had a real practical approach to life, but she wasn't afraid to like reach out for things. And I was so devastated for her when her husband passed away early in the film. And I kind of knew she was going to end up with uh, the brother, Larry's father's character, right? The brother. But I like the way the film went about it. I thought it was subtle. There weren't a lot of wacky hijinks about their relationship. Like I feel like a lot of filmmakers tend to do when it's older people falling in love again. It felt very genuine. She just seemed like a very warm person. Again, couldn't figure out that that was her daughter. I don't know why. <laughs> I feel the same way as far as with her and the two older gentlemen. The only thing I didn't like was her constantly telling Maria that, oh, you need to stay with Tom. You need to be together. I mean, it was like literally in the course of one conversation at the very end, she just changes her mind because she's like, you really want to do this right now? And she's like, yes, I'm going to go dance with them. Oh, okay. Like, it's like suddenly she just lets it go after harping on it in multiple scenes. That was the only part that was kind of like, okay, I know we're at the climax, but not exactly the most genuine situation. Right. And I think definitely in those earlier bits, she's kind of speaking to the old ideals of it's not about right. happiness, it's about commitment and you work yeah. for it and all that stuff. And through her own story, it's like she has these fleeting relationships of happiness. She really connected mm -hmm. with Phil and then he's gone. And then Vince sweeps into her life. I think that definitely held her mindset. I do love bits, though, where she's talking about how, you know, I'm going to give up on love. I'm just going to be here for my grandkids. And then Vince just starts talking about her toes and her shoes. And she goes, wait, were you even listening to what I was talking about? I said, yeah, you were saying something about getting old. Who cares? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lloyd Bridges was fun in this. He was really funny. Now, do you think that if they had done that montage of the next 50 years, they would have shown her going through a parade of husbands and the old <laughs> Aunt Sophia waving a stick of butter menacingly? I want to be like Larry and Maria are like 70 years old and here's this still skeletal Aunt Sophia scowling at him from a corner. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> little did we know, she was only 32. <laughs> mm -mm. But no, I love how there's so many layers to this story. You have the whole broader layer of Edie and her marriages. You have that young couple mm. and their marriage basically setting the whole timeline of the story. 
you even have those two schlubby dudes who just keep gathering in the corner of every family get together judging women I really and... dislike them oh i hated those guys oh they were awful but the comment what would you get if you took away the clothes and the makeup uh... and the other guy says a beautiful naked woman that <laughs> slew me that made me laugh so hard it's funny because it's a joke about how awful these two schlubs are and god lord knows i've seen so many of those schlubs hanging around throughout life <laughs> At least he got sawed in half at the end, one of them. I don't know. Hey, could someone let me out? <laughs> I found that really upsetting, actually. I was sitting there thinking, someone please let that man out? Because I couldn't figure out, so are his legs under the box or what's happening? I, th- I was thinking Probably. way too much about that the whole time I was watching it. He just got him pulled up to his chest. I really <laughs> wanted someone to let him out of that box. That was giving me anxiety. Mm. I thought he deserved it, though, so I was okay with it. <laughs> I love how each of those two guys gets their own specific moment where the one guy gets the box and the other guy gets dancing with Sean Young. Oh, God. And again, the GIFs. (laughs) (laughs) Again, I just love the whole environments that are built around the weddings and funerals and Again, just the whole wedding with the younger couple is set at this whole theme park for weddings where you have like the tour guide and, <laughs> and which party are you here for? You know? Did those really exist? I don't know. But I love how then, you know, <laughs> as Maria and Larry wander off from their wedding, they're literally just walking by all these other weddings that are happening. Here, you want some cake? <laughs> Free cake. <laughs> the scene with the kid in the Cupid costume smoking on the hill was like one of my favorite things in the film. And seeing other people come is like, damn it, I got to put on some Like that was was just so cynical in a great way. I love that. And again, this really fits into one of the things that I've loved discovering most about Joel is the way he builds worlds. Because so much of this film is about the world that these people inhabit. You could just take out the whole chunk of here's a wedding scene from this film and it's like, oh yes, this perfectly captures what a large family gathering for a wedding is like. All the little details, everything. And again, this was kind of what I was missing from St. Elmo's Fire. Because mm-hmm. St. Elmo's Fire, again, it had all the drama, but we yeah. never really got much of the world that these kids were in and inhabiting. Right. And so that's kind of interesting, seeing this further growth of, again, this is a really complicated movie. There's a lot happening in this movie. I think he has a really good handle on a lot of it. Mm-hmm. Now, I have a question for you two. Mm-hmm. Do you think, regardless of what the film showed or what the screenplay had in it, Would you have felt satisfied if Tish and Tom had ended up together at the end as well? Is that an outcome that you think would have been positive? For me, no. I wouldn't have wanted them together. I think Tom needs to be alone and think about what he's done (laughs) because he's a jerk. And she's clearly getting her life together and moving on. So she deserves a lot better than him. (laughs) Right. In the script, which did that, it worked because it did have actual scenes of them connecting beyond their physical affairs, where they actually started talking to each other, realizing they had more in common than they thought and actually had things that they bonded over. But I don't mind that they cut it out. I'm perfectly fine having Tom lose everything. Yeah, same. Except for the trip to Vegas. I have this weird feel. I know nothing about the predecessor. I didn't realize. I actually thought that this movie was the original and that there would be a remake until I looked into it after I watched the film. What I should point out for the second part of this episode, we are going to actually go watch the French film. None of us have seen it yet. Yeah. (laughs) None of us have seen it. But what I want to say, I have a feeling that in the French film that the two opposites would get together as well, Mm -hmm. because that to me feels like the bow tie on the film. Right. And I really like that they didn't do that. I actually appreciated that a lot. Mm Mm-hmm. No, and I'm fine with it. Again, it's kind of a rom-com trope where the old husband is left behind to wallow in his old ways. That's kind of why I like that there was a little bit of a subversion of that by like him and Tish actually find ways to connect. But I'm perfectly fine just letting this guy go. Yeah. Oh, when he said to Tish about his wife, oh, she's too good for me. And the implication, I just yes. wanted to smack him outside the head. You don't talk to women like that. Mm-hmm. Like, who do you yes. think you are to imply that you're slumming it with her when really it is the other way around? Well, and even right. his whole thing of that, you sell Subarus, don't you? No, I sell BMWs, oh, but I'm God. just in a Subaru Ugh. dealership. That made me laugh so hard. He's so awful. He even feels demeaned by the fact that he's not in a dealership that is up to his standards. Right. And again, I like that the film ends with Tish being able to go off on her own. Yes, Mm -hmm. that was great. And I think she has a better sense of who she is and what she wants. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad that the film is able to give her the exit and give her the farewell that will allow her to do that. Again, I really like that Tish as the other woman wasn't played typically like the other woman is and vilified. Mm -hmm. Even if they had gotten together, I don't think it's a relationship that would have lasted. 
Oh, oh no, absolutely not. Especially when he goes to Vegas, because you know he's just going to have a field day in Vegas. Oh, for sure. Mm -hmm. He should bring his coked up buddy from work. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my god. That neck brace would just slow them down. He can't do that. (laughs) (laughs) When I was watching the ending of this, you know, they sail off and they show, oh, it's the restaurant Maria's. And I know that's supposed to be like a really positive, sweet, quaint ending, but I've been watching so much of Kitchen Nightmares <laughs> that all I could think when I saw that restaurant is, do you think that that day-to-day running of their personal business enterprise is ruining their marriage? Is Gordon Ramsay going to come in shouting at them? <laughs> I-, I couldn't stop thinking about what a horrible idea for two people who have no experience in the restaurant industry to open a restaurant together. <laughs> they did get into that more in the script where oh, yeah? this was kind of her dream where it's not that she's a chef. She just always wanted to run a quaint little restaurant so she could sit in the corner and watch all the lives that are coming in and out of it. Hmm. And, you know, he has always had his sense of escape with wanting to go out on his boat. So we'll put a restaurant on the edge of the lake so he can go off on his boat. Oh, I bet the food there is terrible. <laughs> just keep it a bitch. <laughs> that is a bit sappy. Yeah. I just immediately went to the Beastie Boys line where they say open up a restaurant with Ted Danson. <laughs> <laughs> like the moment he's like, I want to run a restaurant. I was like, oh, get the Beastie Boys in here. <laughs> well, I hope that they would have better house wine. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I'm not supposed to be laughing this hard right now. That's just. <laughs> oh, yes, you It's okay. It's, it's okay. It's okay. Uh, I still really enjoyed how this movie was put together. And again, just visually, I think it's beautifully shot. The costumes and sets are incredible. I just want like a whole book of just stills from this movie. I can't disagree with that. (laughs) And even the score by Angelo Badalamenti. This was like Mm -hmm. one of the first real scores he did outside of David Lynch movies. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Because he had done Blue Velvet. And then after this, he went on and did all the Twin Peaks stuff. I really like the score. I did too. I find his Twin Peaks stuff to be a little overbearing at times. They have just a few tracks that they repeat a lot. (laughs) Yeah, that's the big thing with the Twin Peaks. But I really appreciated this. I thought it was really well suited for here. I even love the central waltz theme because I love that there's a sadness to it. Mm -hmm. And there's a complexity to it. Like even when they finally come together and are dancing in front of their entire family, there's this slight off note, there's uncertainty to it. And it's not until you get into the credits that it warms up and becomes even more lush. I was really impressed with the score in this. Mm. And again, I was really impressed at just how awful the cover bands were at all of the weddings. (laughs) It took me a second to realize that they were covering you too. And then I thought, why would anybody ever think that this was a good idea to do it in this tempo? So bad. So bad. That couple who was dancing that sway are exactly the people who would think that's a good idea. (laughs) Oh, I could not get over that. That was such a bad cover. I mean, Mm -hmm. good on whoever figured that out to put that in the scene. That was brilliant. That is why you get a DJ and not a band for your wedding. That was so bad. <laughs> uh, Yeah, <laughs> that right there. <laughs> uh, Laura, is there anything else about the movie that you want to bring up? Well, I do want to say that your enthusiasm for the film is kind mm. of selling me on it after the fact, because there was a lot that I didn't think about. And I think I had such a knee-jerk reaction to the sex trope being used for the couple's intimacy. And I, again, did not like Ted Danson in this mm-hmm. role. Don't have any problems with him in general. Just didn't like it. I think if you had replaced him with another actor, I might have liked this film a whole lot more. I did like the family scenes a lot. And now that I'm thinking about it, I think I did like the film a little more than I originally thought. So I guess I would make this a recommendation Mm -hmm. to see. Angie, what do you think? I'm still kind of where I was. I can't help but in some ways compare this to stuff like My Big Fat Greek Wedding. Mm. I just feel like the family in a movie like that one is so much more alive and consistently funny. Whereas here, I feel like Lloyd Bridges is a good actor, but he just shows up so late and he's not that much of a part of the film. And Ted Danson, not the best for this role. Like, There's too many little things that are holding it back to being a strong film. It's not a bad film by any means, but it just doesn't rank high enough for me. Mm-hmm. Who do you think would have been a better choice for that role mm-hmm. if you could recast him in that era? I've been thinking about that the whole time, and I can't put my finger on who it would be. I know it wouldn't be Ted Danson, but... Again, I think William Peterson would have actually been a really good... Because he does that kind of cool, chill, laid-back character really well, with a kind of intensity to it. 
Again, the thing about Ted Danson is, even though I do have a little bit of that disconnect, I still, again, I think he gives a really great performance. It's a really great character. The only problem is that it's just not like 100% clicking. Mm -hmm. I still enjoyed seeing him in the movie, but I just think, yeah, someone else could have maybe just edged it over there. Yeah. Yeah. I think that would have made a lot of difference for me personally. Honestly, this never would have happened by this point in his career because he was tanking. I actually had Michael Pere in my head when I was reading the role. I don't know. Who is that? Who's that? He had this brief run in the early 80s. He was the star of Streets of Fire, Eddie and the Cruisers, Philadelphia Experiment. Oh, I know who that is. I know who that is. Okay. Sadly, he's like in direct-to-video sci-fi movie hell lately. Mm. But yeah, he had this run in the 80s. I think he actually would have been a really good fit for the role. How old was Larry supposed to be? I mean, I'm guessing they're all kind of like middle-aged. Late 30s, early 40s. Yeah, like I feel like the guy should be younger than Ted Dance. And not that Ted Dance was old at this point, but that's a really good question. I'm having a hard time coming up with like who would be a good sub. Ted Danson would have been 42 when they did this movie. Isabella Rosalini would have been 37, 38. Mm. I mean, this is a midlife crisis movie. <laughs> yeah. Because that struck me when they said that she had been with her husband since they were in high school, but their first child was like five years old. Mm. I kept trying to figure out the age difference. How long do they wait to have children? How old are they? How mm. old is he? Honestly, I think it was Mitch looking 25 that put me on this whole path, and I blame that <laughs> entirely. When I look, William Peterson is just, he's only one year younger than Isabella Rosalini, so. Mm. Okay. I can see this whole scenario where they got married, but they didn't have kids because he was so focused on his career. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that having the kid was almost a way to pull him back from that, and, you know. Oh, that makes sense, yeah. to tension. And- Which isn't to say it's not totally normal for a family oh, to yeah. wait, but in Hollywood mm. films, it seems to me like the age of the child usually corresponds to the age of the parent. It also could be that, you know, they first met in high school and they had this kind of long period of kind of off again, on again, taking a while before they actually got married or because that can happen a lot too. I want to say at one point they say they were married for 11 years. So 11 years. I took that to mean they got married pretty much out of high school. So if they're late 30s, so they wouldn't have gotten married until like the late 20s. Oh, okay. Mm. Mid to late 20s. So after college. I think you're assuming that just because the actors were a certain age. Well, yeah. Actors are supposed to be that age too. I, don't- I think everyone's supposed to be in their mid 30s. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, anything else anyone wants to bring up about this one? I can't think of anything else. Same. I'm tapped out. Oh, you know, the one scene that I love is that we hear so much about the junkyard and how Phil had this Mm. whole business invested in trash because trash is the future. (laughs) And I love that we have one scene where we actually get to go and see this junkyard that he left (laughs) behind that Vince and Edie have. Fabulous junkyard. And I love (laughs) Edie is wearing this cold gray metallic raincoat. Oh, yeah, that was weird. Yeah, yeah. What was the year he projected for running out of space on Earth for garbage? 2020. Yeah, that made me laugh. (laughs) Mm. So, ready for me to just dive into the box office release of this movie? Yes, sure. One of the interesting things about this film when it came out was it really had this kind of mixed reaction from critics. Like, I know Janet Maslin gave it kind of a mixed review, saying she liked parts of it, but I know she was also a big fan of the French one and was kind of holding it to the same standards. Roger Ebert gave this film like three and a half out of four stars. Of course he did. Yeah. (laughs) Unfortunately, I don't know what the budget of this movie is. They never officially released the budget. I mean, I'm guessing probably five to 10 Mm. million. It's a bit of a larger production just in terms Mm -hmm. of all the family and the weddings and all that stuff. Yeah. So I'm guessing it wasn't a hugely cheap movie. But again, this is one of the first ones that they shot up in Canada to cut down on the budget. Mm Mm-hmm. Cousins was released on February 10th, 1989, and it opened at number six. Mm. Ooh. What was it up against? Opening that week at number one was The Fly 2. What? What? Yeah. That opened at number one? Yeah. Oh, God. I've only seen that once. And in the top five, in their like eighth and ninth weeks, we had Rain Man and Beaches. Oh, of course. Mm. Yeah. Okay. And like other stuff that was playing around then, Twins, Dangerous Liaisons, Naked Gun. (laughs) Twins and Cousins. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Do you think anyone ever got those two confused and went to go see the wrong film? (laughs) It's possible. Imagine that crossover sequel. (laughs) Mm-mm. So in its second week, Cousins is still kind of hanging there at number seven. The Burbs opened at number one. Hmm. Love that movie. Angie, can you guess what opened at number three in 1989? Um, Party on. Oh, <laughs> so that was number three. I'm impressed. Bill and Ted. All yeah, right. Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventures opened at number three. <laughs> 
in its third week, Cousins was still at number seven. It's holding steady. So it's still hanging in there. The Burbs is still number one. Rain Man has shot back up to number two. Wow. Hmm. Bill and Ted is still number three. And the only things that opened are like below 15. Mm. Like American Ninja 3, Toxic <laughs> Avenger 2. Oh, God. All right. So in its fourth week, a bunch of films opened that I don't know. And number one was a film called Lean on Me. I'm not familiar with that one. Hmm. Cousins is down to number nine. It's still on the charts. Two films, Dream a Little Dream and Skin Deep. I'm not familiar with either of those. Mm. What time of year was this? We're in March now. March, okay. In its fifth week, Cousins is still at number 10. So it's interesting that it held its position and is just kind of slowly edging down. Right. So it must have at least made its money back, oh, yeah. I would say. Oh, boy. Oh, this is the week that had the infamous box office bomb of the Adventures of Baron Munchausen, which didn't even open in the top 15. Mm. And this is also when opening at number two is... Police Academy, Part 6, City Under Siege. I cannot wow. believe that that series still managed to open a number two, six films yeah. in. I can't believe that. And The Adventures of Aaron Munchausen didn't even open up on the charts. That's amazing. <laughs> that is wild. What a time to be alive. I know. <laughs> In its sixth week, Cousin is down now to 14, so we're probably going to end this year soon. Mm. Bill and Ted's is still hanging there at number eight. Police Academy has dropped all the way to number nine. That's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's better. <laughs> and this week saw the opening at number one of Fletch Lives, the sequel to Fletch. Oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> Leviathan, that terrible underwater monster movie, at number two. Yeah, I remember being scared by that as a kid. Can you believe it? <laughs> Try watching it again. <laughs> oh, no. No, thank you. <laughs> and opening at number four was a re-release of The Rescuers. Oh, okay, because Rescuers Down Under's coming. I don't remember going to see that. In its sixth week, Cousins is still at number 14. Wow. <laughs> it's taken a while to drop off. Mm -hmm. And this is the week that Troop Beverly Hills opened at number seven. Mm -hmm. I thought that film would have done better. And then in its seventh week, is it still on the chart? In its seventh week, Cousins has finally dropped off the chart. And that's the week that Heather's opened. Wow. Oh, wow. And doesn't even appear on the charts and only made $100,000 in its first week. Are you serious? That doesn't surprise me. That flopped? Oh, Heather's was a cult hit. Yeah, cult hit only. I didn't know that. Honestly, yeah. I thought that would have made a big impact because yeah. even watching it later than all my peers had. Oh, it made a big impact when it hit video. Yeah. <laughs> It's like, this is amazing. Yeah. I'm not flocking to the theaters. Well, I mean, even when we were coming on here, even Lost Boys was not that big of a hit in theaters. It wasn't until it hit video. Right. Cousins ultimately grossed $22 million at the box office. And again, I don't know what that's against the budget of, but it still did fine. Again, it still held in the top 15 for, again, like six weeks, I think, six, seven weeks. That's pretty good. Yeah, it's not bad. Yeah. So, I mean, it didn't open big, but it, it had some decent legs. Mm -hmm. Again, though, it's not a film you hear much talk about. No. It's not a film that you hear many people like revisiting or bringing up. Mm -mm. Again, I had like no expectations going into it on this project. Because <laughs> again, that we're coming off of Lost Boys. You have such a right. huge veer from that to this. And then we go from Lost Boys, Cousins, Flatliners, you know? Mm -hmm. That's actually kind of wild when you think about it, because yeah. it's such a different film. If you even look at the films leading up to this, we had Incredible Shrinking Woman, DC Cab, St. Elmo's Fire, and Lost Boys. Like four completely different movies. That's wild. Yeah, he definitely does not stick to one genre, that's for no. sure. Still makes them all his own, but yeah. They still all feel like they were made by the same guy, but I mm. like that he plays around with different types of films. Right. Though I'm wondering if that might have hurt him a bit, because I know be. Lost Boys was building up its big cult following, and this isn't really a film that's going to play to that audience. Right. So it's not really like, hey, you know, Lost Boys just hit video. A lot of people are discovering it for the first time, falling in love with it. Hey, let's go see the next film by this guy. Right, right. Cousins. No, not going to happen. <laughs> right. I think Flatliners is something more that would play to that crowd, but that would still be like five years after Lost Boys. Mm -hmm. They should have replaced What's-His-Face as Mitch with Corey Feldman. I would have liked that a lot better. <laughs> I liked Keith Coogan. Uh, anything else before we take our break or take a look at the original French film, or are we pretty much good on this one? I'm good. I'm good. I'm excited. <laughs> All right, then we'll be back after the magic of editing with our look at the original 1975 French film, Cousin Cousine. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that all properly, but... <laughs> Close enough. There's an E at the end of one of those words. <laughs> right. <laughs> Before 
we start, can I ask you guys something? Sure. Yeah. Did you all see that kid dressed as a Klansman? Yes. Okay, thank God. I'm like, am I the only one that sees this? I thought I was going crazy. I had to freeze frame it and show it to Kevin. I was like, what am I looking at? <laughs> Well, I was going to bring it up, so guess what hey, audio is going to be starting this episode? <laughs> okay. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> oh, well, shoot. Now I really got to start recording. Okay. Shoot. Okay. All That's right. what I'm I get ready. for not doing it. I'm ready when you guys are. But I will say, no, to start it off, apparently, yes, Ku Klux Klans were a typical Halloween costume in France for children in the what? 1970s. Are mm-hmm. you kidding me? I don't know, but that's the impression that I'm getting from this. But also, that was Christmas, right? No, that was Halloween, because that was when everyone was in costumes. Wait, but no, but they had, there was a Christmas no, tree. No, but they were all gathered for Christmas. It's France. I don't know. I have so many questions about France that we'll get to. <laughs> See, maybe when Nightmare Before Christmas came out in France, they just kind of rolled their eyes. <laughs> maybe so. It was funny because the first moment you get a glimpse of the white hood, I'm like, wait, was that what I just thought I saw? Or was it just like a kid dressed as a ghost? I thought it was a ghost. And then you get a full clear shot. It had KKK embroidered on the hood. Exactly. It was in <laughs> dripping blood. Yes. Did you see that? Oh, I didn't realize it was blood. I just thought it was red. Oh, yeah, wow. Yeah, it was actually like there were little blood drips coming off Someone it. Someone put a lot of craft into that <laughs> costume. Wow. Who was the audience for this? I mean, it's a horrifying costume, but, um, yeah. So anyways, we're all gathered here today. <laughs> Part two of our episode on Cousins, where we're taking a look at, I believe it's called Cousin Cousine, which was the original 1975 French film that Cousins was a remake of. Yes. I'm guessing none of us had ever seen it before. No. No. Okay. I would remember this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I have, like, really no production notes on this one. It was co-written and directed by Jean-Charles Tachella, co-written by Daniel Thompson. It was Jean-Charles' second movie. I even just looked at his filmography, and it's, like, all films of this. Hmm. Couple breaks up and has an affair. Family issues. Couple gets together, has an affair. Family issues. <laughs> it's like every synopsis of every film he does sounds like the exact same movie. Hmm. I don't really have a plot synopsis either because while there's a lot of differences in the details, a lot of little differences and changes here and there, Mm. it's still pretty much the same underlying story. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sure we'll discuss the differences. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Again, it's like big family wedding, two couples meet, one of the pairings goes off and has an affair, the other two reacts to that affair by having an affair, Mm -hmm. they end up falling in love, family issues. So, Angie, did you recommend this movie? No. Um, (laughs) No, at first, I was like, maybe I'm just really bored with this because the movie is moving along with so many of the same plot beats, just little touches different, that I'm just bored because I just watched this. But as it goes on, I just really don't like the way this film has just this very laissez-faire idea about infidelity. I don't know if it's a French culture thing. I don't know if it's a 1970s culture thing. But it's just like, okay, yeah, people are avoiding their families and screwing around and betraying their spouses and everyone's cool with it. And it just, ugh, it just left a really bad taste in my mouth. Plus, you know, Ku Klux Klan randomly. So Yeah. <laughs> So, Lord, do you recommend this movie? (laughs) Well, okay, I didn't like the movie. Although I do think having seen French movies of this type, you know, this kind Mm. of farcical comedy that doesn't really work for today's audience at all, I don't think. Mm. But I think it's very representative of a specific type of filmmaking that isn't done here or wasn't. And I think as kind of a time capsule of France in its 70s sexual attitude and Mm. the humor around it, I think it's relevant. I just don't think anyone would want to see it because I wasn't as bothered by the treatment of the affair because to me that was just so very European. I was much more (laughs) bothered by where they chose to focus the comedy. Mm. And also it's boring. (laughs) I mean, frankly, I was really bored and confused a lot of the time, but I will give it the benefit of the doubt because that might be just a lot of being an American and not used to watching French films. But yeah, I couldn't get into it. Yeah. And I don't recommend it either. It's not terrible. Again, I can see why this would have had a following back in the 70s when, I don't know if you remember Angie, when I covered Bloom in Love, Mm. it's very much a film of that ill. But it's so loose and so laid back and so disparate and just so uninvolving, I want to say. I never got pulled into it. 
with two exceptions, with the exception of two specific things, I prefer every single aspect of what the remake did with this story. Yeah. I thought for sure I was going to like the original, for sure. And to find that I actually appreciate the remake more after watching this <laughs> was kind of a weird experience. Although I do think the one thing that this does have over the original is the character of Ludovic. Yes. Is so much more. He's one of my two things, yeah. Yeah, what Ted Danson mm. was trying for and not quite sure. getting. And the other thing was the daughter, Nelsa, was so much better than Mitch. That's the other thing. <laughs> yes, okay. We're on the same way. Those are my two things where it's like on yeah. paper, I think the character of Ludovic is much richer in the remake, but the actual actor, Victor Leno, is just so much more kind of laid back, charismatic, and mm -hmm. looks astonishingly identical to what exactly Ian McShane looked like in this time. <laughs> That's exactly what Ian McShane looked like in the mid-70s. It was weird. Wow. And then you have a daughter, how she had kind of a more laid-back, acerbic feel than the uh, trying-too-hard Mitch. Yeah. I agree with y'all. I wouldn't necessarily call Ludovic charming, but I do think he was definitely a better actor for that role than Ted Danson mm -hmm. was. I still like Mitch, but Nelsa is kind of an interesting counterpoint, a similar way to do it. Obviously, you know, it's 70s, so we see her doing slides instead of video. Right. I wanted more of her. If I could get a yeah. movie following her, I would be very happy. Oh, yeah. I found out she's actually got like 10, 11 credits, but I don't know if, how many of those are lead roles mm. or supporting roles. But what was interesting is just kind of looking at this and the remake in terms of approaching the remake as an adaptation. Mm. It's fascinating how it's like someone just took notes of moments in this movie right. moments mm -hmm. bits of dialogue little bits here and there and then just remix them around you have like moments that have been moved to other characters yeah. a single line that's now been expanded into its own subplot mm -hmm. it's fascinating just how the remake just picked this thing apart and rebuilt it in all new ways mm -hmm. yeah I mean, even bits like, I thought this was going to go where the remake went, where the elderly mother of the family ends up then falling for the brother of her dead husband. But then they just kind of write that off, and then she ends up falling for this young magician. Oh, good. That wasn't just me. I could not figure out if they were supposed to be together. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah they are. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> but then it still ends with, now it's her instead of one of the schlubby guys at the wedding, but her being trapped in the box, being cut in half, and everyone having their moment, and she being like, can someone let me out? Mm -hmm. And then that's just it it's like <laughs> oh god yeah the ending of this movie the is end. just so abrupt yeah. but again it's just weird how i'm really fascinated by how the remake picked moments from yeah, this the, i'm taking the present back yeah was like a totally different context yeah yep. or even the daughter telling the story to the children and then completely changing it with mitch you know or even mm -hmm. she just has one dropped line where she's in a restaurant saying how can these people be filling their faces while all these children are starving and like mitch gets an entire yeah. subplot of that you know right right <laughs> Stuff like that fascinates me in terms of like adaptations mm -hmm. and reboots. I'm glad that the remake added in that, oh, now I can't remember her name, the ant character. <laughs> Aunt Sophia, yeah. Yeah, she was like a nice little addition. It made much more sense for her to take the present back than the mom. I didn't quite know why the mom really yeah. wanted to do that. I couldn't figure <laughs> that out either. When she was saying, I'm taking my gift back, I was like, why? I was yeah. so like, confused. The married couple didn't... Well, I mean, I guess the husband was getting in the fights with Pascal. But Pascal was being the jerk. Exactly. Oh, he was so exactly. awful and that whole scene was like a train wreck. So Laura, what did you think about Pascal? <laughs> oh my god, what a pathetic excuse for a character. Character. Oh my god. If that's what they were going for, I mean, well, I should say, great job with the actor because, right. man, I hated him. Like, <laughs> I was like, why is March still married to him? Like, he's so antagonistic. He's so pathetic. He's such a child. He's just such a hedonist. And he doesn't think in the whole speech he's giving her sister at the end before he roughs her up, which really rubbed me the wrong way. Oh, God. Yeah. But that yeah. speech about how I kept my infidelities in private and that's moral. And when she laughs at him, it was gratifying because it was like, why would she even stay married to this guy? Was there that much of a stigma about divorce that they couldn't have just called it off? I didn't understand that. Probably. Probably so, I would guess. I mean, yeah, he's definitely like even more so than in the remake. Like he's such a textbook cheater, nasty. I mean, he's just a slime ball. His look, everything about him. You just, oh, he's awful. He's really awful. I know. Like the whole scene where he gets wasted at the wedding and just starts groping every woman he comes across. Yes. Oh my God. Uh, it was so weird because I'm thinking if this is supposed to be funny, like I'm just finding this so cringy, yeah. but it's happening in between. Between mm. these beats of people fishing, right. Right. it 
was such a strange juxtaposition where I was like, it's funny that they're all fishing or is this a normal thing to do at a wedding reception or am I supposed to be laughing at this? Then I felt like, do they want me to laugh at the way he's treating this woman? Because they obviously did because at the end he kind of sneaks off with the fist to the mouth with that look right. he gives the guy mm. and I'm thinking to myself, why is this the funny part? <laughs> right. Or even the bit where it's like after he's been groping everyone, he just kind of lays down, throws his shoe in the water yeah. and goes to the fisherman. I'm a fish. Catch me. Right. And yeah. it's like, oh, so we're supposed to laugh at his antics? Like, this is gross. Mm. The whole construction of this movie, it's not even scenes. It's vignettes. It's like we're just constantly cycling through these tiny little vignettes where we get a little bit of dialogue, a little non sequitur punchline, and then we cut to the next vignette. Mm -hmm. I've seen other films do a similar structure, but I don't know if it's just the jokes that aren't hitting or if they're not trying to be funny. Yeah. It makes it hard, and like I said, once again, I don't know if it's a cultural right. divide. We don't know how good the translation is, too. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, that's true. But it's like, is this supposed to be played for laughs or not? I mean, it's not funny, to me anyway. I think some of it is cultural. Mm -hmm. I even did recognize what the trans... I mean, my French is not good. I haven't ever spoken it fluently, but there were a couple times that I noticed that the translation in English was a little more verbose than what they were actually saying. Mm -hmm. And it was mm -hmm. so that they could give it a flavor in English that French people would understand intrinsically. There was one line, I wish I had written it down, but I could tell that they added a little bit more of an explanation in the English subtitle because it wasn't mm -hmm. something that was conveyed in the words themselves. And I think that's part of it. But the other part of it, I just don't think this stands the test of time. I think this would have been funny to that audience. And today, it, there's too much cringeworthy stuff going on to laugh at it. Mm. Right. That's kind of interesting then comparing it to the remake where it's so rich in how it envelops you in the settings of its sequences. Like, again, you never really got sucked into the world of the weddings in this movie like you did in the last one. Mm -mm. On this one, you have the funny dance scene where they're all just kind of dancing in the apartment. In the remake, you get that with or without you scene of cinematic excellence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's where, again, why I like is that there's such different styles and such... I'll be honest, what's interesting is Joel Schumacher's St. Elmo's Fire is almost more in this style where it was just these little vignettes that kind of build a story. Mm. Yeah, I can see that. I think it was more absorbing. There was a little more depth to it, a little more meat to it. Yeah. But it's interesting that his version of Cousins is such a different style and such a different level of richness to the material. Right, right. And I also just never got any emotional weight from this movie. No. And nothing seemed to matter. Not right. Just the way that they are having so much fun flaunting their affair, basically. Mm-hmm. I do like the one scene. They finally sleep together and she comes home to her husband and before he can say anything, she just says, shut up. If you say one word, I'm going to leave you and never come back. Yeah, I did like that. See, I guess to me, I liked it so much better once again in the remake, because in the remake, it's like, if you talk to me about your infidelities, then it's over. Right. With this one, it's like, yeah, I just did the same thing you always do. So don't talk to me. And it's like, to me, it's so disgusting that I'm right. not amused in that moment. In terms of the moral ramifications of what the story is telling, again, I didn't find the fact that they were having affairs to be, because I mean, it's a farcical French comedy. Yeah. I mean, that's just to be expected. Mm. What I did find offensive was how cruel they were. I mean, obviously, Pascal deserved whatever he got, mm -hmm. but I felt so bad for Corrine. Yeah. And I felt like they were really leaning into mocking the whole mental illness situation, Absolutely. which again, it did not translate. And I feel like you could make a dark comedy where that scene at the end where she's thinking about slitting her wrists in the bathroom and she can't go through with it because it hurts too much, because that is a funny scene. And I think in a darker film that would have worked as it was, it was awful. Mm. It was like, why are we laughing at this yeah. woman? She needs help. Right. What's funny is that specific scene with the razor blades, that was actually in the script for the remake, too. Hmm. Really? They did have the Sean Young character attempt to do it, but then she ended up cutting her finger on the blade and it hurt too much for her to go through. But it didn't play it for humor. In fact, she ends up just kind of breaking down. Oh, my God. Hmm. And I think that played to kind of more that serious look at separation, anxiety and loss and all that stuff. Yeah. I think the biggest thing that the remake added was emotional depth. Yeah, absolutely. Because again, there's a broader sense of consequence of guilt of all mm -hmm. this stuff that's going on on both sides right and kareen is played as a kind of dismissible airhead throughout this movie which is a shame because she's going through a lot of really rough stuff mm -hmm. well she's definitely coded as like a hippie yeah the wardrobe and the way that she was into all these things that would have been considered a bit new age at the time you know the sleep therapy all these very modern strange psychological stuff she was participating in by the way that sleep therapy sounded awesome <laughs> i like the fact 
fact that you could sleep all day and be woken for two hours and then go back to sleep. I don't know, man. Maybe it's just me, but that sounded great. I felt that she was definitely coded as this whimsical flower child. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it also translated to this very naive young woman whose husband kind of treated her as he did his daughter. And that really didn't sit well with me. Right. Again, I think it's she's not taken seriously. Mm -hmm. It was kind of fascinating that one scene where it's Martha and Ludovic sitting down and talking about, have you ever had any affairs in the past? And she had and he hadn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. See, I felt like I wasn't sure what the film was trying to say because when I... I don't think it's trying to say anything. Yeah. But I mean, I felt like there was an implication there that because she had, and that seemed like in the world of the film, that was totally normal and understandable. But the fact that he hadn't, were they trying to imply that he was more patient with his wife? Were they trying to imply that he was a better man for that? Because it didn't seem like that was the message of the movie at all. No. So I wasn't sure what that scene was even really about. My interpretation of it is that he does enjoy the kind of freewheeling lifestyle that she has, even though that ends up kind of leaving him burned every now and then when she goes off with someone else. Or at least they don't perceive their relationship as being a serious one. And yet they still have that commitment. And yet she does have emotional ramifications when he does end up drawn to someone else. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's more about how he's the one that has the emotional maturity to see the relationship for what it is. It could be he's just tired of being with someone who's still acting that young. Mm. Right. But she also doesn't seem to see it as a freewheeling lifestyle because it's so one-sided. Right. I think that was what kind of informed her attempts. And they both had very childish attempts to get their spouses to pay attention to them again. But her whole take me to the place we were first dating and, you know, I was so beautiful and it it comes across as very immature, like something a teenager would do. Or even her whole thing of writing the message on the mirror of I'm leaving it's for the best and then the very next scene she She comes comes back back. I can't leave you yeah exactly yeah but I didn't want to laugh at her and I feel like the film wanted us to laugh at her right I guess that's what it comes down to is like if this is supposed to be a farce but yet most of the time doesn't feel comedic enough for me to be comfortable laughing it just Mm -hmm. feels really mean-spirited most of the time and again I think that's where the remake was really interesting in that Okay, this couple were burned by their spouses having an affair. Mm -hmm. While they're connecting, they try to paint it as, well, we're trying to get back at our spouses. We want them to think we're having an affair. But as they continue doing that, they see the genuine hurt it's causing. Because again, you have that really nice little scene between Isabella Rosalini and Sean Young in the bathroom where she like kind of just tells her it's okay. Yeah. But then it gets to the point where they actually emotionally connect to the point where they have the affair. But then she has the whole, and now I just lied to my child. Right. And here, man, nobody gives a shit about the kid. That son is just so forgotten in the background. And that's kind of where I love the remake. Did the whole story thread about the child not getting enough attention. (laughs) And this film, they just don't give the child any attention. No. Poor kid. Yeah, I thought that was a little strange. Well, I felt like the kids at the end when everyone's looking out the window and smiling as they're driving off into the night, and it seems like we're supposed to be happy that the kids are happy about it. But what are they really happy about? Like, I didn't understand why. Mm. The adults are gone. They have free reign of the house. The mom is still caught in a box. Well, you know what? There is that. I guess so. I I (laughs) I didn't consider that aspect of it. It's Halloween, Christmas, Lord of the Flies. Can we talk about Halloween, Christmas for a second? (laughs) Because... We can understand what's going on. Like I said, they keep saying it's Christmas, yet they're dressed like it's Halloween. So I'm like, is there a French tradition there I'm not aware of? I have no idea. I actually thought the little scene, it was only like a half a minute where Marta's sister and her husband are playing with the train set on the ground and she tries to take over and he smacks her hand. I actually laughed at that because I felt like that was trying to underscore how childish all these people are really. Yeah. Mm. Like the whole idea that, you know, oh, they're all just kids opening gifts and they're all having a good time and Pascal coming down with the fake knife in his back and laughing it off. It was almost like, oh, see, everything's fine. Nobody got hurt. Mm -hmm. You know, everything's totally normal. There's a kid dressed as a Klansman in the corner. (laughs) Just like family Christmas. This couple just goes off to fuck in a bedroom while everyone else is celebrating and their spouses are sitting there. Mm -hmm. Like just miserable. Miserable. And I don't know, man, that, oh man, tonally that was so weird to me. And like I said, I guess once again, it's supposed to be funny. It's supposed to be, oh, look how goofy this is. But instead, you're just like, wow, no, they're being awful to their family members. This isn't cool. Well, now you know how I felt when I was watching Santa almost fire. <laughs> <laughs> 
what about the ending of this? Because again, it ended really abruptly. But yeah, it just happened. I watched it all the way through the first time. And the second time I kind of just skimmed it because I really didn't want to watch it again. And mm. when the ending comes, I was waiting for something, something revelatory or something nope. maybe signifying like, so are they off to a better life? But it seems like they were just going to go have sex at some other place. So yeah. I yeah. didn't really understand what the point of it all had been. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Honestly, I think the bigger revelation is, hey, there's a restaurant that serves nothing but cakes. Oh, that was great. <laughs> Can we go there? Like, right? Holy shit. <laughs> I have another question about French traditions. Why were there squirrels at the first wedding? Oh my god, I made a note of that. Why were there the squirrels, squirrels in, a cage? in a cage? What was that all about? So confusing. <laughs> so nobody knows, right? Like that was just I'm googling no. squirrels at weddings. <laughs> Because it was like the wedding's over, the reception's right. over, and then a man comes out with a cage with squirrels, with squirrels in, in it, it and sets it on a side table and then turn the lights out. And it's like they focus on that like it's supposed to be something. Right, right. But it's literally just a cage with squirrels in it. I know. It's so bizarre. All I can find are a bunch of Etsy listings for squirrel cake toppers. <laughs> Are they all from France? No. Is there a common theme? I can't find anything else about why there were squirrels at that wedding. If they would release them at the end, similar to like how people would release doves. But no, they were just in the cage. I don't know. So what did they use them for? Were they wild squirrels? Were they like raised know. in captivity? I'm asking too many questions that nobody I has know. the answers to. So many no. questions. So many questions. Squirrel cage was the first note I made about this film. Was right? I just wrote squirrel too. cage. I was like, <laughs> so that's going to come back again right now. Okay, so we need an entire Disney film where we see this film from Chippendale's point of view. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> oh boy. I did like the character of Bijou in this one. Mm -hmm. I kind of mm. liked her better than I liked her counterpart in the remake, only because she had this very European kind of, I'm an older woman, but I'm having the time of my life. And even though my husband's gone and I'm miserable, I'm going to take up with this young man. For a second, I really didn't realize that was the film because I'm like, wow, he's really flirting with her, isn't he? I was like, get it, Grandma. Like, she's living <laughs> her best life. I love that. And I love that she didn't really seem to care about the affair at all. She was just busy teaching her grandkids to sing. <laughs> right. <or> whatever. <laughs> that was another weird moment. At Halloween Christmas at the end, and she was getting cut in half. And I kind of wanted that woman's life. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Googling France Halloween Christmas. Or wearing costumes on Christmas or something. You know what? Actually, now that I think about it, isn't there a tradition of masquerade around the holidays in France? Maybe. Oh, yeah. Maybe so. I don't think it's such a Halloween thing. It's a just general family holiday thing. The costumes were really weird. There was the gorilla. Right. There was what looked like a small child dressed as a bald porcelain doll, which really freaked me out. <laughs> I freezed it a couple times just to make sure I wasn't seeing things. The robber mask, I guess, is what that was supposed to be. Like he had like the black mask, but then also five o'clock shadow or... I don't know if that was the character. And then what about the kids that came out with the motorcycle helmets with the police batons and started beating the old people? Yeah, God. Wait, <laughs> when was that? That was near that the end where the kids came out with the plastic <laughs> batons and just started like assaulting everyone. Oh, yeah. yeah God. Like, there was so much going on. I think at that point I'm like, I don't even know what's happening anymore. You should have had a whole scene of the father going up to the son and being like, why are you assaulting everyone at the wedding? I learned it from you, dad. I learned it by watching you. <laughs> Apparently, Halloween is still celebrated in France with its own costume party, and I don't see anything about Halloween costumes in Christmas. I don't know. Yeah, maybe Laura's right, because they also remember the kids were putting on the bunny costumes at the wedding. Right, That was weird. Right, yeah. Was it Easter? What was that? So maybe it's just like kids wear costumes at events. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Man, 70s France sounds like a party. <laughs> I love the whole thing about how it's like we're having a party where the kids now have to cook and serve the meal to the parents. Yeah, that's a cute idea. And you get the whole anticlimactic scene of, oh, and he cut his own finger and nothing ever comes of it. Yeah, that was it. And no one seems to care. Again, there, there's like so many just little kind of non sequitur moments, like the whole bit where the husband was kind of depressed in the bedroom. What was with the scene where he takes a gun out of one drawer and puts oh it in the God. other drawer? I kept waiting to see what mm. was going to happen with that. I thought he was going to start shooting people from the window. Like, that's how messed up this film was, because he goes over it and he's handling it. And I'm thinking, first of all, who just has a gun in the dresser? Mm -hmm. And then it never comes up ever again. Nope. Seriously. Somewhere Chekhov is rolling in his grave. I know, right? <laughs> what was that? 
<laughs> Sorry, I'm getting so excited about this. I just you can't show a guy holding a gun in a farcical comedy in Europe and then nothing ever happens again. That doesn't make any sense. It's very bizarre. Yeah, it's so weird. And then he sees a car accident outside his window. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then he's like enjoying that. Yeah. There's even just weird little narrative bits like they go up to the apartment except for Kareen and Nelsa who stay on the ground waiting with yeah. the car and the motorcycle. And then they're like, well, we'll stay in the apartment so the grandma has to call down to the window for them to come up and join them. Why would you even have that scene instead of just they all go up to the apartment? Yeah, yeah. I don't know, man. This movie was just, <laughs> you know, I guess I would recommend it for all the weird crap that happens. <laughs> I wish it was a little weirder. Right. But it has that perfect level of surreal. But it's not absurd in a way that makes mm. me laugh. No, it's, it's absurd not. in a way yeah. that's just kind of like, what? Right. But it is full of very strange moments that don't pay off. Yeah. It does make me wonder if that's just this director's style and maybe it's not supposed to. It might Like, be. you know, maybe his movies are full of these little weird bits. I don't know. I mean, what was funny was even when they get into the room to have sex together, Together. It's like there's not even any sex. It's just let's just have all these little vignettes of them just talking or playing or there's even the scene later on where it's like she brings the tattoo marker and they're drawing all over each other. Mm -hmm. I actually thought that was kind of cute up until the point where they're washing it off. And I'm like, OK, we've seen enough of this. But when she comes in and she's like, I put my son's kitty tattoos on. Yeah. And I thought that's kind of funny. Like she seems kind of fun. And then it keeps going on. And I do kind of like the whole joke of it's not rinsing off. But then they never right. pay that off at all. Again, yeah, never pays off. Yeah. Shouldn't you be like focusing on trying to get it off your face where it's the most obvious? Oh my God, right? They're scrubbing their arms. I'm like, get that big heart <laughs> off of your forehead, weirdo. Right? Yeah. Especially him because it's like he's been yeah. like fully done up. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, that looks awful. I mean, that would have been funny if they'd shown up at the party later on and mm -hmm. they still, still have had it. Yeah. That would have been funny. That would have worked. It was so obvious. Why didn't they go for that? Yeah. And no one notices it on her because she knows how to cover it up, but he, he's just... <laughs> he's still got that in like mask all over his face. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I did want to talk about this, the relationship mm -hmm. with Nelsa and Ludovic's father, the grandfather. And I realized watching this why they made Nelsa a boy in the remake. And it's because there's that really touching scene. I actually found it very touching and fun where she's sitting on the steps with her grandfather and he's mm -hmm. joking about, do you still want to kill people? And mm -hmm. then she tells him very sweetly how she's about to be 17 years old and I made love to a boy for the first time and it was nice. And he kisses her on the forehead and I thought... That's such a French kind of, you couldn't have that relationship in a film in an American comedy without people thinking, what is up with this grandpa? He's a creep. Right. Right. But I feel like that was so perfect. Yeah, they definitely have a different era of accepting that as a coming of age type thing. Mm -hmm. I thought that was really sweet. That yeah. was like him thinking, oh, this sweet kid, you know, isn't that yeah. just what the youth are like? And I thought that was unexpectedly very touching. And I realized there's no way that would translate for an American audience. They had to make him a boy and they had to have his grandpa buying him porn instead. Because otherwise, you know, we don't have anything to relate that to. <laughs> right, right. Right, sure. And you know what I absolutely got tired of in this movie? Hmm. Da, 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 I had da, it in my <laughs> head yesterday. <laughs> that oh one piece God. of music that yeah, they just the kept using. The entire score was just that one piece of music. Pretty much. It really was. In just different scenes, it would pop up. And it's mm -hmm. like, here it's got an orchestra, here it's just a piano, but it's still the exact same melody just over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And it was weird how it's like, obviously, they would use that to punctuate humorous moments but there's like also like weird dark moments that it's like suddenly a fight breaks out at the wedding there's blood dun, 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 dun. <laughs> <laughs> this guy just tried to grope everybody and is being evicted from the wedding dun, 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 dun. <laughs> that's exactly what it was like this woman yeah. is stuck in a box while her grandson is dressed as a clansman and credits <laughs> scene where at the very end Marta goes over to her son and pulls off his KKK hat and you see the letters and the blood dripping and she's like oh honey like shouldn't she be like my son where have you gotten this horribly offensive outfit and we need to talk about racial yeah, injustice yeah. right now I was like wait does nobody notice there's a Klansman? She probably yeah. bought it for him. I I'm mean thinking there's a reason why they don't play this one on Turner Classic Movies that often. Yeah. Well I actually wondered if it was cut even more for the DVD release that we saw it because I kind of felt like um, the version that I have is the European disc. Oh, it is. Okay, because I was going to say you could never really see it. You could only see like glimpses of it. So the first time you're like, oh, is that really what that is? And then the second time I actually had to freeze the screen to see the KKK across it. 
And I thought, so did they know this is kind of weird? Or have they not thought about it? Do they just not care? Or is it just so incidental? I think they would have cut the entire shot where you clearly see him. Yeah, if they were going to do that, right. Because there's nothing that's revelatory about that scene. Mm -mm. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. But I'm just so confused. It threw me so bad that I felt like when the end of the movie happened, all I wanted to do was get an explanation for that five seconds of KKK on the screen. I did not understand what I was looking at. Yeah. (laughs) I have, I have, I dun, 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 was, dun, dun, yeah. dun. <laughs> it was just so offensive and so weird. And to me, it threw anything I liked about the film. And again, it was so laid back and casual. Exactly. Yeah, anything yeah. I could have liked about the film in that one moment, all the goodwill it had incidentally built up was just like, France, what the hell is going on over there? Yeah, I know. And it makes you wonder, Mm -hmm. it's like, did they just not fully understand the cultural implications? But they had to. On some level, I think when you've got a mass that announces you're a Klansman and it's dripping blood, I think on some level, I'm I'm doing a lot of pantomiming with my hands and I just realized you guys can't see this. (laughs) It's being conveyed. Don't worry. I think it's one of those things where it's like, oh, it's all the way on the other side of the ocean. So yeah, we're not endorsing it. But isn't it funny? And like, no, it's not. It's not. I mean, it is a scary costume, but perhaps yeah. not for the reasons they want it to be. No. So yeah, that just raised so many cultural questions that I feel like I'll never have answered. I'm Googling France Ku Klux Klan. <laughs> <laughs> you got to get on a watch list, bro. <laughs> yeah, not getting anything other than the French Wikipedia page. For the <laughs> <laughs> no, this movie, man. Yeah. Uh, so, Laura. Yes. Between this and the remake, if you had to choose one film oh to God. watch once a year, every year for the rest of your life, which would you pick? No, this isn't. I well, love remakes. Okay, I tell you what. Let me bring out that question when I can. If I could invite people over to watch this train wreck with me, I would absolutely pick the French version because I would love to just watch people's faces as they take this nonsense in. Oh, it would be a wonderful era of confusion movie for a whole group. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. But for real, mm-hmm. like, you know, obviously the remake is so much better of a film. Mm-hmm. You know what? If they could have just put the actor that played Ludovic into the remake, that might have actually worked. Or even just getting in McShane. <laughs> <laughs> Because apparently this actor, he almost entirely did French, except he was in European Vacation as the thief. Hmm. Oh, my God. Okay. I, you know what? I didn't recognize him. I'm trying to yeah. recall the face of that guy in my head now. That's like the only American film he did. And I'm guessing it was because it was set in Europe. Probably. Probably. Yeah. He was great, though. I really liked him. Angie, same question to you. <laughs> uh, Duh. It definitely (laughs) gave me a lot more respect for the screenwriter or whoever did the original adapting of this one, as well as, you know, what Joel did with the remake, because they took some nice moments and made a much more nuanced film. It's still not going to be one of my favorites that I would go back to much, but I definitely like it a heck of a lot better than this. (laughs) I will forever be grateful for this film for ultimately setting us down the road that led to the With or Without You sequence. (laughs) But that's it. I think the remake does a much more superb job of adding depth to the material. Even just Mm -hmm. the great triple layer storyline of how you have your main story, you have the whole background story of the grandmother and her relationships, and then you Mm -hmm. have that even further buried story of the young couple meeting, getting married and having the baby, which gave the entire remake a timeline. Yes, yeah. it didn't have that here. We couldn't figure out how long it took for anything to pass. Yeah, who was Jocelyn and why were they even at her wedding? And I don't think they were, because there was the one couple at the first wedding, how, you know, he was playing with her leg under the table and then yeah. they went off to have sex. I don't yes. think that, that was not them. No, that was not. No, it wasn't. Not. That, that was just a totally different. And then they asked, yeah. oh, how are we related? Like, that was just so, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> like... <laughs> It was cute, but it was so unnecessary and so yeah. strange. It's like they wanted an excuse to show a naked lady. And they didn't need one. And they didn't what well, she didn't actually have any nudity <laughs> that she was covered up. Yeah. She was yeah, she was pretty covered up. A shocking lack of nudity in this film then, I should say. <laughs> Except for Martha just you know, being topless for a bunch of scenes, mm-hmm. but that's about it. Oh yeah, well, you know, God bless. Yeah, we needed the topless shot of her cutting his toenails. I, you know what? <laughs> that I, was kind of funny. <laughs> I found that funny and also weirdly intimate, like in a way that like kind of got me on their side. Exactly. Mm-hmm. It's so laid back. It's so French. It yeah. is. It was. And it was so like, 
Oh, that's sweet. <laughs> I mean, even the whole tattooing scene, it's just so laid back. These two are definitely yeah. so comfortable with each other. Mm -hmm. But again, yeah, the remake adds so much more richness and complexity. It adds so much yeah. more emotional weight. It mm -hmm. really gets into a lot of the complicated thought processes of an affair. Mm -hmm. And I really love the characters so much more. I, I just, yeah, man, I got to go with the remake. Yeah. Oh, I feel like the focus on the original is not really the affair because that's all played as though it's not important. Oh, yeah, it's just a farce. But I do think that the focus of the original film is so mean-spirited, at least for a modern audience, that I felt like the joke we were always being asked to laugh at was how terrible these people were. Mm. And if not terrible, then pathetic. To me, that was kind of what the movie was about. It was a movie about a bunch of goofy things happening yeah. to some very sad people. And the affair was almost incidental. Mm. I've seen other farces that are like this, where it's just these very disparate little vignettes and non sequiturs and all that stuff that are really hilarious and funny, even some that are foreign films. But this one, it just didn't really do anything for me. I'm wondering, again, what it would have been like had we watched this film first. Right, yeah. Without the context of the remake to compare it to. I can't imagine, actually. I know, it does make it hard. I don't think we would have liked it, but I think we're so much more animated by how <laughs> much better the remake did it. Right. Honestly, yeah, I can imagine myself enjoying the remake a lot more if I'd seen it after this. I didn't know how bad it could be. Well, it's just reminding me of some of the reviews when the remake came out who were like, it's amusing, but it's not the original. Like, you haven't seen the original in 15 years, have you? <laughs> mm. Yeah, because even by the standards in 1989, that was pretty, oh, yeah, yikes. So you want to hear something funny about Cousin Cuisine? Yes. This film was nominated for three Academy Awards. I was just noticing for that what? on IMDb, and yeah. I'm like, seriously? It was nominated for Lead Actress, for Screenplay, and for Best Foreign Film. Okay, lead actress I can see. Mm. I didn't think the character was that great, but she was fun. Best foreign film? What else came out that year? I have to look. That's just so like, I mean, okay, the foreign language film, maybe, but really? Like, best actress? Yeah, like, was everything else that bland in that year? And best screenplay, too? Right, right. It doesn't even make sense. I do wonder if it benefits from that idea. I think that's always been around at the Academy Awards, which is changing now that the world is so much more close-knit and multicultural. Cultural. But I feel like back in the 70s when this would have been nominated, the film would have probably felt very fresh to a lot of American filmgoers who hey. might have focused on the mm. fact that it was so open. No, because Robert Altman was already doing movies like this, and this was a pretty common style in the 70s. But not so much the style, but the story itself. I feel like the idea of these characters having these silly lackadaisical adventures that don't mean anything, and it's a sex comedy, which is pretty light on the sex for a sex comedy, but mm. I feel like there was something about it and I feel like American audiences are extremely eager to give films the benefit of the doubt when in the language and maybe think that they were better, more interesting. But I don't think it would get away with it now. I've got the nominees up for you. Oh, please. Mm -hmm. Okay, please. so for Best Actress, it was Marie-Christine Baralt. She was mm -hmm. up against Talia Shire and Rocky. Hmm. Wow. Liv Ullman in Face to Face. Haven't seen that. Sissy Spacek and Carrie. What? Mm. Which I forgot was nominated for an Oscar. And they all lost to Faye Dunaway in Network. Yeah, that makes sense. Which was a major movie. Okay. That makes sense. The Network was like probably the big film for everything that year, I imagine. Yeah. Best screenplay written directly for the screen. We had The Front, Seven Beauties. I've never heard of that one before. Mm. Oh, Lena Wertmiller. Okay. Rocky. Mm. Wow. And they all lost to Network. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that makes, again, that makes sense. All right, let me look up foreign film here. Now those I'm really not going to know. This is what I'm <laughs> curious about. Foreign film, we had Jacob the Liar, which was a German film. Yeah, I remember. Seven Beauties, Night and Day, and they lost to Black and White and Color. Mm. Jacob the Liar, they remade that with Robin Williams for an American audience. Do you remember that? Yeah. Okay, that's why the title sounds vaguely familiar. Yeah. Yeah, it's a Czechoslovakian Holocaust movie. Mm. But yeah, I guess I can kind of see, and I don't mean to make it sound like people are giving an advantage to a French film because maybe they don't get it. But I do think that there is some mystery to it that if the whole film were in English by English speaking actors that they knew, they might not find it so charming because it's so different than the expected American attitude towards sex and marriage. So I think it has that going for it, the benefit of just being so new. Mm -hmm. Even if the style is not new. Well, and this was also years after Bob and Ted and Carol and Alice, mm. the film about swinging. I haven't seen that. So, I mean, stories like this were like, even going back to the 60s, a story like this wouldn't have been shocking in Hollywood. Right. You know, even Seven Year Itch was even saucier than this movie. <laughs> <laughs> 
Anyways, I'm looking up Black and White and Color, which actually won the best foreign film. This sounds fascinating. It's actually an African movie about the French versus the Germans in World War One in Africa from the point of view of the Africans about this entire war being fought on their homeland that they're not a part of. Oh, I want to see hmm. that. That sounds like it could be great. Yeah. Yeah. So anyways, I don't really have anything else to add about Cousin Kazin. No, no. it's just not, not great. No. Mm-mm. So anything else anyone wants to add before we bring things to a close? No, I have nothing else to say about this movie. <laughs> Why squirrels? Why squirrels? <laughs> I will say that. <laughs> just if anyone out there knows French culture of the 70s, help. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if anyone has any more insight, if anyone thinks that we're wrong about this film, I would be genuinely curious to hear more from that perspective. If anyone has seen any of Jean-Charles Tichella's other movies, yeah, let us know. I would be curious to see. Granted, I think our listenership has not even seen the remake, let alone this movie. <laughs> right, right. But hey, we could be wrong. You never know. We could be wrong. <laughs> And again, the ultimate legacy of this entire episode is, holy shit, the with or without you scene. <laughs> well, actually, what I'd really like to see is that scene recut with the music from this film. Dun, 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 yes, you yes. literally just beat me to that joke. Dancing to this song. <laughs> oh, yeah. Just that one shot of Sean Young walking up to the table and then just cutting into the arm dance. Dun, 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 mm-hmm. dun, 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 dun. <laughs> If it synced up perfectly, that would be really fun. You know, I'm imagining, you know, there's that great dramatic scene at the lakeside cabin where Ted Danson wakes up and he looks and there's Isabella Rosalini sitting out there by the lake and she looks in at him and he looks in at her. Dun, 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 dun. Wow. Yeah, I never want to hear that tune ever again, and yet it's going to be in my mind for the next few years. You should make that the theme for your show. Oh, fuck no. No. (laughs) That'd be great. I'll make that my ringtone. All right. Well, thank you again, Laura, for joining us. Yes, thank you. Absolutely. And again, we've already got you on the schedule to come back again, so we'll hear from you again soon. Yes. Excited. (laughs) All right. Good night, everybody. Good night. Bye. For additional episodes or to leave a comment, please visit schumacast.blogspot.com. That's S-C-H-U-M-A-C-A-S-T dot blogspot.com. Schumacast can also be found on Stitcher. Our opening song, Letter, and our closing song, Vein Blossom, were created by Jack Locke and are used with permission. To hear more, please visit jacklock.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. Schumacast is in no way affiliated with Joel Schumacher or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended.